Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting of Wednesday, June 7th. Uh, we are coming to you tonight for a hybrid format uh, from the Savage Center and school committee member Joan Giblin is coming with us remotely. Um, I'm going to ask everyone that is in attendance to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and, and to the republic, the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, first order of business um, is the approval of minutes. We have three sets of minutes, four sets of minutes in our packets this evening. Uh, the business meeting minutes from May 17th and May 31st, as well as the executive agenda, executive session minutes from May 17th and May 31st. Are there any questions on the minutes this evening? I move by Teresa, is there a second? second? Seconded by David. Because we are hybrid, I will need to do roll call vote. Um, so I will start uh, with our remote. Um, Joan? Yes. Teresa? Yes. Kate? Yes. David? Yes. And I'm a yes as well, so that passes five to zero. Um, second order of business is correspondence. Dr. Thompson, do we have any correspondence this Please evening? Chair. Great. Um, and then lastly, um, not lastly, <laughs> by far, uh, is, uh, the next item on the list is our warrant report. Um, so this week I signed warrants in the amount of $1,848,130.02, $5,274.28, $173,792.80, $1,249,958.84, $21,067.96, cents. $78,060.79, $85,878.19, and $4,146.70 for a grand total of $3,467,309.58. Are there any questions on the warrant report this evening? Great. So moving right along um, to our next item on the agenda is public comment. Um, as a reminder to the community, public comment can be accessed um, uh, during our meetings, you can register for public comment in two ways. You can call the superintendent's office uh, by noon the day of our meeting um, to register, to pre-register. You can also register in person at the meeting by signing in when you arrive. Um, so this evening, uh, so this evening we have uh, one, two, three, five people pre-registered for public comment. Um, just as a reminder to those for public comment, I think um, you were all provided with um, copies of our public comment policy. Uh, public comment um, is kept to three minutes per person, um, and the entire public comment um, segment will be no longer than 30 minutes so that we can move on with our business meeting. Um, so with that, I'll declare public comment open at 7.13, um, and the first, um, and I believe the first three on our list would like to join together at the table, no, one at a time, okay. We walk back on that. Okay, so the first <laughs> the, the first person um, that we have registered for public comment is Mr. George Yusevich. To the chair, members of the school committee, Dr. Thompson. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to be here before you. Tonight, you will hear many reasons why the middle school was named for Dr. Philip Oldham Coakley, an esteemed educator in our community, and it was well deserved. To work with Dr. Coakley was both a privilege and an honor. He was a mentor, role model, colleague, and in later years became a close personal friend. Other superintendents would turn to him to seek advice and counsel on various educational issues. Dr. Coakley even proved to be a visionary advocating and supporting the hiring of minority staff when he was superintendent. He had a presence. You knew when he was in your building. He was revered by his teachers and administrators who worked with him in the Norwood Public Schools. I was hired by Dr. Copley in 1965. With his help and advice, I became a better teacher and administrator. I proudly served 50 years at Norwood High School and was principal when our new building was built 12 years ago. I mention that because I think it's a salient point relative to the Copley Middle School. 
We built the high school, it was a brand new state-of-the-art facility. The campus would be set back. It was still the school on the hill, located at the same address, 245 Nickel Street. There was never any discussion to change the name. It was and continues to be Norwood High School. The new middle school campus will remain in South Norwood on a new footprint, the same address on Morse Hill, 1515 Washington Street. There should be no discussion to change the name. It is and should continue to be Copley Middle School. We are all here tonight to ask you, our elected school committee members, to listen to your constituents and reconsider your previous vote. Dr. Copley's memory and legacy should remain alive by keeping the name of the new building, Copley Middle School. It is the right thing for you to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eustache. Um, next on our list is uh, Mr. Mark Joseph. Oh, Helen's going to yeah. Helen, we'll come short. I'm sorry, Mr. Eustache corrected me. So, Mr. Mark Joseph and Ms. Helen Regan. Very nerve-wracking on this side of the table. Good evening. My name is Mark Joseph. I'm a lifelong Norwood resident, and I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. And I want to thank you for your time and service. I was a member of the Norwood School Committee in 2004. At that time, we were changing from the junior high to a middle school model. We unanimously voted to name the school the Dr. Philip O. Coakley Middle School. The school was formally dedica dedicated in 2004 with Dr. Coakley and his family in attendance. If you would please refer to the four documents that provided you in your folder, um, I'll be referring to those. The first one is the official ballot question on the override to approve the new Coakley Middle School project. The second one is from the town manager, the superintendent, the Norwood Middle School Building Committee, thanking the voters for approving the new Coakley Middle School project. The third document, which is from the Norwood Public Schools' own website, has the project branded as the New Coakley Middle School Project. And finally, from the Norwood Middle School Building Committee, there is a public invitation next Tuesday, June 13, 2023, for the Coakley Middle School groundbreaking ceremony. Clearly these show that the name is the Coakley Middle School. We'd like to know when was there an issue that needed to put this to a vote. We would also like to know why was this decision made. Was this because you were unaware of Dr. Coakley and his lasting impact on the Norwood Public Schools? What is very disturbing is the fact that children would be allowed to change the name of a school which the public has already voted on, especially a project of this magnitude. What I ask is that all of you please reflect on what is presented tonight, keep the Coakley Middle School, the name as is, out of respect for the legacy of Dr. Coakley, his family, and the voters. I would also like to ask that the children attending the middle school be made aware of the history of Dr. Coakley and all he did for their school system. This is an important piece of Norwood history that we should not erase from the books nor the building. Again, thank you for your time and your service. I'd like to now introduce um, Helen, Helen Coakley Reagan, and that's um, Ms. Dr. Coakley's niece. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. Helen. Hi, I'm Helen Reagan, and I live at 14 Nickel Street and I'm the niece of Dr. Philip O. Coakley. And I'm here to represent the Coakley family. After reading the article on Norwood Patch, our family was shocked and saddened to hear 
that the superintendent and the school committee were asking for suggestions for new names for the new school. The article also stated, be part of history. My thinking is why not teach the history as to why the school was dedicated to Dr. Philip O. Coakley. And just for your information, and I have heard others mention that Philip O. Coakley's, his middle name stands for Oldham. Everyone in the town says Oldham, but it's, <laughs> it's really Oldham. And the Oldham School is named after his grandfather. And as of now, there are over 750 signatures on a petition to keep the school the same name. Our family, please, we ask you to honor and respect our family member, his legacy, and keep the school the name that it was dedicated to in his honor Dr. Philip O. Copley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Reagan, and thank you, Mr. Joseph. Okay, next on our list uh, is Ernie Kretschkowski. I always say that wrong, Ernie, I'm sorry. Pretty good. Kretschkowski. <laughs> Kretschkowski. <laughs> Thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, my name is Ernie Patrzykowski, and I am speaking as a board member of the Nord High School Alumni Association and as a resident. I would like to share a little history of who Dr. Coakley was and why we want to maintain the name the Coakley Middle School. Dr. Coakley was a 1936 Nord High School graduate who lived in the town and raised his family here. As superintendent for 18 years, he oversaw the school system during a time of tremendous growth in our town. During his tenure as superintendent, he opened the Oldham and Willett Elementary Schools, oversaw three major expansions, the Balch, the Cleveland, and the high school, which basically doubled the size of the old high school. In a 24-hour period, a fire destroyed the junior high and three grades, three grades woke up the next morning with no school to go to. He had to implement double sessions for the students with all the logistic problems that would go along with that. He saw the building and opening of two brand new junior highs, basically at the same time. In one summer, he closed two more elementary schools, the Winslow and the Shattuck, and combined them into another new elementary school, the Guild School. Due to overcrowding at the high school, he instituted the open campus concept, where if students didn't have a class, they could leave the school property. You must remember that the drinking age was 18 back then, which brought yet its own set of potential problems. Even with all of this, the students of Norwood continued to receive a first class education, and graduating classes were consistently over 500 students. Buildings, parks, and other things have been named after people by past town boards to honor and remember those who contributed to the betterment of the town, and so that their names and accomplishments would not be forgotten. Let's not erase the part of our town's history. Instead, let's teach the students who these people were and why the buildings are named for them. Having students being part of the process is a wonderful idea. There are many ways that they can be involved and contribute to the new school. In my opinion, choosing the name of the school is not one of them. I don't think that you will find a person more worthy than Philip Coakley, so we urge you to reconsider your position and continue to call it the Coakley Middle School. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bostikowski. Senator Wright, the second time. Um, next um, on our pre-registration is Ms. Sarah Quinn. Hi, I'm Sarah Quinn. Um, I think most of you thought you got rid of me when my youngest graduated, but here I am. I don't have a lot of um, eloquent remarks to add based on what's already been said tonight, but I do want to present the um, Petition that was referenced earlier um, as residents of the town of Norwood. We are respectfully asking the renaming of the Coakley Middle School be taken off the agenda 
We believe the name of the middle school should be preserved as the Dr. Philip O. Coakley Middle School as it was dedicated in his honor. It is important to the community that we continue to honor his legacy, a legacy of service and deep commitment to the Norwood Public Schools. And this um, petition has over 750 signatures that was gathered over the last five days, were gathered over the last five days. Um, the one piece I did prepare to talk about was the family aspect, and I know that was touched on already by Dr. Coakley's niece. Certainly not as big a deal as having a building named after you, but there is a ball field in this town that was named after my grandfather, who was an educator, who passed away. And it is a point of pride in my family. When my kids were old enough to go to that park, we pointed to the rock and talked about him. When my sons played baseball, we talked about it. And I talked about it so much, I finally got Babe Ruth to change the name on the schedule to Gormley Field instead of Wilson Street. Um, Similarly, there was a painting of my grandfather that was in the high school office um, for a long time. It had been commissioned by students, I believe, after he passed away. And it was a point of pride to me when I attended the high school. And then when I later worked in the high school, it felt good to know that you know, people knew my grandfather who I never met and thought highly enough of him to um, sort of maintain his legacy in some small form. When the new high school was built, the painting disappeared. And that was equally emotional for my, my father in particular and my aunt were sort of disturbed by that because this was a big deal to them and now it was missing. We have found that it was in a closet and it's been returned to my family. Um, but I just want you to think about the lasting implications of a name. It's not just words on a building. It really does mean something to the people who have made the decision and the people who were impacted by the decision like the Coakley family. So I respectfully request that you keep the name. And I will um, leave this petition with the names here for you so you can read it at your leisure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, that concludes all of the people who are pre registered. No one had signed in, but I do want to check one more time because we do have some more time left if anybody else would like to speak during the public forum. Okay. Um, so, with that, at 727, I will declare public forum closed. I want to thank all the speakers who came this evening. I will pause for a moment because I know there'll be a little bit of shifting on the way out. Thank you. All right, so um, moving on with the business meeting, um, we have several appearances this evening. Um, first on our, um, on our agenda uh, is our Student Advisory Council, uh, here to give us their quarterly and final update and recommendations for next year's Student Advisory Council. So welcome Ms. Kira O'Donnell, uh, Ms. Kiki Dellum, no, yes, Kiki, right? <laughs> I was like, I don't want to get her nickname wrong. <laughs> and Ms. Sophia Tuma. Are you guys going to come up as well? Come on up. <laughs> come up and get recognized. You guys did a lot of work this year. <laughs> Next one, too. Right, here we go. Um, as we've done in the past, the 
student advisory council members met with their respective principals to gather information on the schools, um, specifically any, anything of relevance within academic activities. Um, this time around, there's one general student feedback section. Um, from meeting with a couple members of the school committee during Windock um, during school, we decided to focus on asking about school start times, ideas for activity additions, and any general negatives or positives students may expect their school um, when we talk to them. Um, some members of quarter were able to meet with the students. Um, uh, a student, groups of students, um, or heard student feedback from principals speaking with their student councils. Um, and you'll notice that um, when we get to that section, we predominantly receive feedback from the elementary schools. Um, this time around. Um, since this is the first year, um, kind of, we ran into some unexpected difficulty gathering information during the busy end of year season, mm -hmm. um, as compared to kind of the rest of the year prior. Um, for that reason, our Coakley reps were unable to um, meet with the principals or principal or students um, due to scheduling. Um, so there's no Coakley section, but in its place are a few slides on future directions, um, because all this trial and error can be used to help us figure out what to do better in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, while there's no middle school section, one great thing we've heard through word of mouth. Um, is that there were several student groups that entered into the Mass STEM Hub Showcase, um, which is very exciting and a good one, um, so that deserves to be recognized. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as always, I'll start with elementary schools. Next slide, please. Um, in the world of academic highlights, it was great to hear about the many reading initiatives taking place throughout the district this time of year. Um, at the Cleveland, there's the Battle of Picture Books, which is a bracket-style competition between different grade levels. Um, next week, they also have Drop Everything and Read, where students can invite loved ones to read with them outside. Um, right now, the Prescott has a similar reading challenge going on and um, Walk to Read for students as well. Um, reading really does seem to be a theme right now, um, um, as there's also Poem in Your Pocket Day, where students and staff brought in poems that they read to one another. Um, recently, there was also a collaboration between the high school and the Cleveland, um, where EYC, or the Environmental Youth Coalition, uh, came to the Cleveland and did globally minded projects with students through the Solar Pump program. Um, and to continue with the reading theme, a few schools had readathons. Um, at the Cleveland, they had mystery readers come in each day to surprise students. Um, for example, um, representatives from the police or fire departments. Um, and during that, there was a PTO sponsored book swap as well. Um, our rep that interviewed at the Old Ham shared that there's been a focus on getting students involved with STEM, um, specifically cu computer science this year um, with coding and library class. Um, one really impressive academic highlight is at the Prescott this year, um, where a student actually made it to the statewide level of the Scripps Spelling Bee, um, and the school plans to make it an annual event after this year's success. Um, many schools have also hosted STEM nights for families over the past few months. Um, at the Prescott specifically, they brought in community partners, um, including the Robotics Club at the high school, um, the Nora Trails Committee, and the Sustainability Commission. Um, and for all elementary schools, the students are finished up with their MCAS testing as well. Um, for activities, there was recently the Fine Arts Festival that brought together all of the schools in the district. Um, in the gym, there were a lot of elementary school pieces of art um, on display for the families to see. Um, many celebration events have been held, um, for example, the Black History Month Laser Show Assembly at Cleveland, um, and the St. Patrick's Day celebration that brought in step dancers from the community, um, and our very own finance director on the back by the <laughs> front of the high school as well. Um, schools such as the Botch in Cleveland held student-run dining nights, where students took orders, brought food out, um, and sometimes wore big mustaches <laughs> around the cafeterias. Um, and many old Oldham students also recently took a trip to the high school and got to try out uh, TV production with NCM members. Um, so in class, the high school students got to watch um, the videos they produced um, as well on the new news. Um, at the Cleveland, participating students in the dance a are raising money for an outdoor sensory area as well. Um, and to celebrate Autism Acceptance Month, the school also had a reading of All My Stripes, an inclusive display for all students to participate in making and see kind of their thumbprints on that display. Um, and recently, the Prescott hosted Matt Brown and Boston Bruins Foundations um, as well as there were firefighters for um, an assembly in healthy habits and anti bullying. Uh, for more activities, um, schools such as the Prescott are planning to further incorporate Shine Bright assemblies um, into the beginning of the school year and the fall to help with student anxiety getting back into the swing of things in the, at the beginning of the school year. Um, over the past few months, many students participated in various honors ensembles for band, orchestra, and chorus. 
Um, recently, several schools had their end of year concerts for band and orchestra as well, um, which were hosted at the Copeland Middle School. Um, at the Cleveland, there are Boston Children's Hospital reps coming in to do a summer safety assembly for students before the end of the school year. Um, at the Bosch, there is the recent Spring Fling Luau. Um, many students held, let's see, this many schools held Memorial Day ceremonies um, where students could sing and play their instruments. Um, right now, there are many field trips going on, including YMCA ropes courses, zoos, um, visits to the Concord Museum, uh, Gillette Stadium for a STEM day, um, the New England Aquarium, and many more. Um, there are also end of year events specifically for fifth graders. Um, such as step-up day to the Copley Tunnel Field Day, school field days, a moving up ceremony, um, and a celebration by the year. Um, recently, um, there are senior walks as well um, at all the, all the uh, North Elementary schools where um, high school seniors could visit current students and see their old teachers, which was a lot of fun. Um, and at the Cleveland, um, their student council reps plan to replant flower boxes around the school. Um, which my brother insisted I can forget to mention because <laughs> you need to do some self promo. <laughs> Slide, please. And the next up is the high school. For academic highlights, um, students are well into term four, um, and the final day is uh, June 21st. Um, seniors are already all done. Um, underclassmen have taken MCAS, and many juniors are taking or retaking standardized tests like the SAT or ACT. Um, AP tests were completed throughout May, um, and the results for that come out early July. Um, and course selection is going to be finalized soon, um, so then students will ideally receive finalized drafts of um, their courses for next year um, in the following week. And um, recently, the honors banquet was held to celebrate juniors and seniors um, for their academics, and that was held at the Fort Points. Last week there was also class day, which was an award and scholarship event for seniors. Um, and coming up is a similar underclassmen awards event um, to celebrate underclass, uh, underclassmen's um, academic success. Um, and recently the first ever healthcare innovation cohort um, that partnered with Harvard Med celebrated their final day of those seniors. Um, and for those going into a trade or straight into the workforce, there was a career banquet as well for those students. Um, and most re recently graduation was this past Sunday. Um, so there are a lot of Celebration events going on. Um, and also notably, uh, North High School started a committee this year um, to look at increased support for first year, first year students. Um, so 15 staff members are meeting regularly and will continue to look at different aspects of student life and the stakeholders over the next 10 months. Next slide, um, for activities, um, this year over April break, there were three successful international trips with over 60 uh, North High School students participating in total. Um, so in Tiffany, France, England, Ireland, and Wales. Um, the French exchange program recently wrapped up as well, um, and all students can go back home safely. Uh, Pops Night was a music event that invited the community to the high school gym, um, and there were choral and instrumental performances there, um, and there, there was also the awarding of many senior scholarships. Um, and notably, the high school actually received the Best Communities for Music Education Award uh, this year, which is very exciting. Um, and there, also, there was also the Fine Arts Festival, um, so that got elementary, middle school involved, but also the high school too. Um, so there are choir and theater performances, um, as well as instrumental performances, and there's displaying of artwork as well. Um, and related to fine arts, um, many students succeeded in MICA and MATG performances this year as well. Um, for more activities, the high school also held World Language and Culture Night. Um, spring sports wrapped up regular seasons um, at the end, by the end of May, um, and awards ceremony was held for that as well, and many students won MVP and coaches awards. Um, the tournament season is starting the first week of June, um, and with seniors gone, uh, the high school is welcoming incoming ninth graders on June 12th. So um, Mustang mentors that are current juniors will be the early school. Um, this is kind of a new section this time around, but um, as mentioned earlier, from meeting with a couple members of the school committee during one block, we decided to focus on asking about school start times, um, ideas for activity additions, and any general negatives or positives the students notice about their school. Um, from the start time, um, for the start time at the elementary schools, um, which um, is actually earlier um, rather than later at the high school, um, it was kind of funny hearing the responses, but. Um, some Cleveland and Prescott students and that they didn't even realize there was a time change at all. <laughs> uh, some students pointed out preferring to get home earlier from school, 
um, it was more free time for them in the afternoon. Um, and actually, it was kind of nice um, related to that. A few students reported feeling happier um, with more after school time as there's less of a time constraint for them. Um, so there are fewer stresses and pressures to complete homework quickly and squeeze in all their activities after school. Um, some other students noted that there's not enough recess throughout the day um, because um, at some schools before school recess was eliminated this year um, with school starting earlier in the day. Um, at the high school level, um, the start time was pushed slightly later. Um, so many students involved in after school sports um, talked about missing having some time between the end of the school day um, and their activities to decompress. Um, and many felt more physically and emotionally tired than usual this year um, since they don't have that time between anymore. Um, as expected, many other students that didn't necessarily do sports um, are grateful for a little bit of extra sleep. Um, however, some students argue that the later end of school day means they end up finishing their homework later. Um, so there's no real sleep benefit anyway. Slide, please. Uh, there wasn't a ton of feedback for adding clubs and activities, but some students pointed out adding um, an after-school sports tournament club or a club. Um, for general feedback, there's um, a lot from the elementary schools, um, so I'll just read it all off. But um, some pieces of feedback are definitely more relevant than others, um, but it's just what the kids have to say. Um, one nice one to start off with is that at the Prescott, um, the kids um, said that they don't perceive there to be bullying at all and they feel very safe there. Um, at the Balch, some students noted feeling um, that there are too many students in each classroom, which can sometimes be overwhelming when they're trying to learn. Um, at the Balch, students talked about the cafeteria running out of certain lunches, so not all students received what they order in the morning. Um, another really nice one that I liked was at the Cleveland, students feel supported by teachers and comfortable asking for help when they need it. Um, and at the Prescott and the Cleveland, uh, there are positive reflections on activities they're currently doing, like literature, literature fish bowls, which I've never heard about before, but that's at the Prescott. Um, the spelling bee, the day of coding, um, different field trips they're going on, and um, uh, one Cleveland student pointed out the senior walk as something they liked as well. So, uh, for more general feedback, um, one student at the Cleveland pointed out that he and his friends um, wish that classes were a little bit more challenging as um, sometimes they had trouble paying attention. Um, at the Balch and Prescott, there were complaints about temperature during the warmer months. Um, at Cleveland, some students mm -hmm. knew that the water fountains and bathrooms go out of order frequently. Um, and at all the schools, um, uh, it was pointed out that students really loved the specials in their schedule, um, which is nice. Um, the Balch students mentioned that they wish the class time was longer, um, as they don't feel there's enough time to receive the instruction and then get super involved in what they're about to do. Um, and also, there are school surveys in the whole district uh, throughout the year, but um, a student at the college pointed out that um, some of the questions were a little bit confusing and maybe not at an elementary reading level. Um, so while this is just one student, it's definitely important to think about for like accuracy reasons when trying to get feedback from elementary students. So, uh, finally, we have uh, future directions and areas improvement for the Student Advisory Council. Um, and maybe not all of this will happen next year, but it's definitely um, some things we want to start to think about um, for the new council and um, try to figure out what this group means, pretty much, for Norwood. Um, most importantly of all is um, just making sure that um, all student advisory council members in the future understand their roles and responsibilities um, and are committed to completing them throughout the year. Um, this was tricky this year, as um, going into it, none of us were really sure um, what we were doing, so we had to try things out along the way. Um, and we're still trying things. Um, but the role um, is now included as part of all of vice president's roles um, in the expect expectation sheet for student council when we run for office. Um, also, there's a better understanding now of what the role entails, so hopefully everyone um, who runs will be on board to do it um, as well. Um, for the liaison specifically, um, I highly recommend attending the Mazda conference in the beginning of the year, um, I think that Dr. Thompson said. Um, while so many of the people there were kind of going above and beyond, um, doing so much more than I ever could, um, it helped contextualize the role for me, I think. Um, and I got to see what it eventually could maybe become, or like what we could work toward. Um, in our WIN meetings, we also talked about eventually maybe connecting the liaison um, to kind of the longer term student council agenda, and maybe they could eventually speak um, if that's something um, that the liaison that year is interested in. Um, and Related to that, uh, the student council primary elections are this week, and then the final elections are next Tuesday. 
um, and this will determine who the members next year are. So there, there might be um, shifts in some of the roles and who's running, so all the faces won't be entirely familiar. Um, but those who are elected should ideally meet to discuss plans and expectations over the summer um, before the first quarterly report in the fall. So, next slide. Um, a specific area of improvement of ours would be finding a more efficient way to get student feedback from all schools. Um, gathering all or most information from just principals can sometimes be challenging, um, as understandably they're very busy with everything else they have to do. Um, while principals would still be greatly helpful with um, our overall school reports um, for our academics and activities, um, a focus for next year should be maintaining regular contact with different student groups um, as, uh, as well. Um, the purpose of the Student Advisory Council is um, to show the realities of the overall student experience, quoted from the handbook across the district. Um, and the only way to do this is speaking directly with all sorts of students, um, which we started doing this year, um, but can do more efficiently next year with um, what we learned didn't work this year. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, this year we came up with um, a working document temp template for next year's Student Advisory Council to use, um, and they can do that in a collaborative way. Um, this template contains prompts for principals when discussing academics and activities, um, certain questions to ask students and general topics to discuss when getting feedback from them, um, and resources like past presentations and the Student Advisory Council Handbook. Um, a major focus this pilot year was beginning with just the quarterly report, um, but if a lot of helpful student feedback is collected next year um, through regularly reaching out to different student groups, um, then the uh, Student Advisory Council can begin completing certain parts of the policy manual to look at in the presentation as well. Um, with the help of the school committee members during our uh, WinDoc meetings, um, it was determined that the Student Advisory Council would mostly look at sections I, J, E, and K. Uh, lastly, we hope to increase engagement and communication from the Student Advisory Council to the students, um, and vice versa from the students to the Student Advisory Council. Uh, new this year, there are monthly Student Council newsletter emails sent out after our meetings to the whole student body. So we've gotten a few Student Advisory Council updates in there so far, a couple times um, toward the end of the year, um, but um, we're hoping to make that more regular next year. Um, we were thinking next year adding a Google Form link to this too, so that there's a direct place for um, at least high school students to write feedback um, directly to the council. Um, also, the Student Council Instagram can be used for updates as well, as it's probably the easiest way to reach students, since not really anyone checks their emails anymore. <laughs> um, the morning news is another method, um, and the other senior member, John, uh, made this graphic that um, is on the slide um, that was shown throughout our last few weeks of school in the morning news. Um, it says committee, so I guess it's up for everyone next year to finalize committee versus council, what we want to say. <laughs> next slide, please. Um, and that is all we have for the final quarterly report. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for being so welcoming to us this year. Um, and thank you to specifically Mrs. Stewart, uh, Mrs. Mazzola, Mrs. Sibbing Dunn, um, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Gavin, um, and pretty much everyone else. Um, I really appreciate um, how welcoming you guys were to us this year um, and open to, to our trial and error throughout <laughs> yeah, this process. Um, just because I graduated doesn't mean I'm gone, so um, <laughs> I'm happy to give my personal email. And, um, help is ever needed over the summer or fall or after that. Um, and <laughs> and um, while I won't be here next year, um, we have our other members here who will be. Um, so they're going to introduce themselves and say hi. Okay, I have a person. Um, I'm Sophia, and I'm the Vice President of the Class of 25. I'm Kaylee. I was the Vice President of the Class of 2024 this year, but next year I'm the President of the Class of 2024. And this year they helped with um, the Copley sections for the presentation. Um, I just want to thank Kira for putting, uh, all of you, but um, putting together the slides and it was great to meet you a little bit. Congratulations on your graduation. And um, yeah, I think we did learn a lot. You know, I, I joined the process a little bit later, but I think what you guys sort of, this an inaugural group have helped us figure out um, where we where we can take things so much appreciated and thanks for gathering all this input it's great to hear directly from our students so thanks
it's not appropriate to clap when I'm meeting, but I know. I wanted to clap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a really just great job, girls and, the, and boys. I know Kevin and, and John are not here tonight, but thank you again thank you. for being our inaugural. I know they're eagerly running away and they don't have to come back, but I, I, I do just want to thank them again. And, you know, I had the honor and privilege to meet with the group a couple times during the wind walk. From, what was it, 1019? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> um, but they, they're, you're a great group. You're a great group. And Kira, thank you for coming, even though you already graduated. Um, you know, the emails that we exchanged, the work you put in, I already said it to the three of you, but um, no apologies necessary. Um, you've done amazing work. As Kate said, you know, thank you for learning and trying and growing with us. And I'm just really excited where this is going to continue to go. And student voice is the absolute most important. Um, and I just encourage all of us in the district to get more and more of that student voice and engagement as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Good luck. Bye, guys. Okay. Who's going to follow that up? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, next on our list uh, are Mr. Longley and Mr. Kerr for our Athletics and Fine Arts recognition. We have Mr. Longley here. Uh, is Mr. Mr. Kerr is, is remote. Um, are we, who wants to go first? John, okay. I'll default to Mr. Longley. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're most welcome. <laughs> Okay, good evening, thanks for having me. Um, I'm here to, we're gonna recognize some of our uh, spring sport athletes. We did hold our spring, um, Booster Club hosted our spring sports award night, awards night last Wednesday. We just concluded the, the spring season today. Unfortunately, the baseball team uh, lost to Milton, so that officially ends our uh, athletic year today. But overall, it was, a, it was a great year. We had you know multiple teams participate in the in the MIA tournaments. Um, we had nine nine teams qualify for the tournament. We had a 500 record. Once we did qualify, we had two TBL championship teams over the course of the year. So it was a really um, good year for athletics. Uh, some of our individual awards uh, from the spring. I'll do our NHS um, awards first, uh, boys lacrosse, MVP Frankie Flores, unsung hero Ryan Valeri, coaches award Kevin Sopel, girls lacrosse, coaches award Caroline Forrest, coaches award Emily Fame, MVP Olivia, uh, Olivia Lodge, softball, MVP Samantha Rose, Coaches Award, Athena Alexopoulos. Coaches Award, Madison Collins. And head coach, uh, Carol Savino, was the TBL Coach of the Year for the second year in a row. And the team also uh, won the TBL championship softball team. So congratulations to them. Uh, baseball co-MVP, Jack Cropper. Co-MVP, Sean Dittmeyer. Most Improved, Quinn Burgess. Girls Tennis. Coaches Award, Allegra Michalik. MVP Zoe Fowler and most improved Kim Lea. Boys Tennis, Coaches Award Ty Tyler Lovell, Coaches Award Jano Ju, and MVP Partha Jamal and Daka. Boys Track and Field, Unsung Hero Luigi Gentile, most improved Andrew Delaney, Coaches Award Eric Whaley. Girls Track and Field, Coaches Award Christina Fontaine. Coaches Award Natalie Martin and Coaches Award Jordan Robinson. Um, something that we do at the Spring Awards Night um, every year is we recognize our student athletes that participate in a sport every season since they entered Norwood High. It's unique to Norwood and um, this year's group was that they were freshmen when we had the season that, that wasn't in 2020 uh, but there was an added season the following year so they could have participated, uh, they still could have participated in 12 seasons, but we gave them credit, um, you know, that first uh, COVID 2020 was standing. So we had 13 student athletes that participated every season that they could, and that's, that's, that's usually really where we are, but just tremendous commitment by them to do that every season over the course of four years, particularly through COVID and coming back. So really significant accomplishments. So those seniors were Dylan Hamway, Sean Dittmeyer, 
Dylan O'Brien, Jack Brady, Caroline Forrest, Kaylee Brown, Jenna Nauman, Sally Cadet, Conrad Schletzbaum, Joe Domingo, Ryan Kelly, Leanne, Sa Leanne Sad, and Tyler Lovell. So, um, as far as Tri Valley League, up is a uh, boys volleyball awards that were on the next page. Perseverance was Zach Smith. Most improved Xavier Walkins, and coaches award was Joe Green. So moving on to the spring uh, Tri Valley League uh, recognition. For baseball, Jack Cropper was an all-star, Sean Dittmeyer, all-star, Quinn Burgess, honorable mention, and Angel Valerio Oliveira was honorable mention. Boys lacrosse, Frankie Forrest, all-star, Kevin Sopel, honorable mention. Girls lacrosse, Olivia Lodge, all-star, Emily Fame, Caroline Forrest, and Olivia Naughton, honorable mention. Softball, <laughs> Samantha Rose, all-star, and Athena Alexopoulos, honorable mention. Girls tennis, Safika Camaro was an all-star, and Livia Zaldivar was honorable mention. Boys tennis, Partha, Jamal, and Dhaka was all-star, and Jano Joe, honorable mention. Boys track, Dylan Hamway, all-star, Dylan O'Brien, honorable mention. Girls track, Christina Fontaine, all-star, Natalie Martin, honorable mention. And boys volleyball, Xavier Walkins, all-star, and Joe Green, honorable mention. So congratulations uh, to all those student athletes and coaches. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Thank Langley. You. Congratulations to all the students, and congrats to you on a very successful athletic year. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for your continued lot. support, and have a great summer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langley. Okay. Thanks. And Mr. Kerr. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lumley, for taking that hit. It is always uh, it's always so hard to go after Kira in that report. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should actually check in with her because half of what I'm about to say is the duplicate of what she dutifully uh, digs into and says. But um, just I'll, I'll go through uh, some of our our spring information and some of its crossover, perhaps from what we've talked about before. But um, we'll, I'll go through each individual. Um, discipline. So uh, start on the art side of things. The art, uh, National Art Honor Society this spring inducted 28 members. The Friends of Visual Arts with support from the Moral Memorial and grant from the Northern Cultural Council is hosting Yard Art, which is a community-wide art event where residents create something unique for their yards. And to go along with this, FOBA is sponsoring Yard Art Scavenger Hunt for the whole community. So they'll get to go around to all the yard arts um, and, and try and come up with um, the information they need to win prizes. So um, there are displays going up all over town over the next week or so. Uh, new displays at the Perks, the Morrill Memorial Library, and the Savage Center uh, are all in process of being changed this week. And our art students got out into the community. Uh, students in 3D Design 3 created an art installation around the theme of elements that was installed at the Attleboro Art Museum as part of their high art program. Um, they went down there for a day and were able to set up a, a 3D art uh, display. Over in the drama world, I know that you were aware of the festival play, Ash to a Flame. They advanced through the prelims, the semis that were held here in Norwood and performed at the Back Bay Event Center in Boston at the end of March. Uh, additionally, senior Samantha Megan won second place in both the METG One Act Original Play Festival and the Sherwood Collins Playwrights Festival. So a little extra shout out to, to Sam for, for doing some, some great things on the writing side. Um, on the music side of things, the late winter and early spring is a busy time for performing ensembles. So again, some of what I'm going to say uh, may have been mentioned before, but here's a list of all the accomplishments at our state music organization events. Uh, at the high school, at NHS, our jazz ensemble took a bronze medal at the MAJE Cape Cod Festival. The concert band uh, took a bronze and the orchestra a silver at the MICA Concert Festival. The Madrigals took a silver at the MICA Choral Festival. The concert chorale took a high silver at the MICA Choral Festival. Uh, most recently, three of our NHS students auditioned for the MICA Solo Festival. And again, um, MICA is the Massachusetts Instrumental and Choral Conductors Association. It's the governing body for a lot of what we do. Um, and there's uh, a bunch of different competitions throughout the course of the year, and the ending one was the Solo Ensemble. Uh, and we had three students uh, get recognized there, two received high silvers, and those were 
were Caden Bell and Stephanie Kertiki, and we had one gold, which was Lindsay Collins, who actually received a perfect score, which was pretty impressive. Um, moving, moving along, the choral program um, was able to provide a return to singing the national anthem, so they were able to work with Mr. Longley and some of the sports teams. They hop back in with basketball this year uh, and continue to look forward to singing the national anthem at many of our home games. As you may have seen, Norwood was named one of the best communities for music education by the NAM Foundation in 2023. Uh, we were only one of 16 towns in the Commonwealth to receive this honor. Uh, the awards are bestowed upon districts who have a strong music program uh, as a result of both support from the town and the community. There's a bunch of factors that go into that, um, but a lot of it has to do with how heavily supported the students are in the class, how heavily supported the students are from the community. Um, so it's a real honor uh, to, to get that award. Uh, we had a, a good time this year trying to get our students out and into the theater a little bit more. So there were three trips that went to see musicals this year, the Mean Girls, Les Mis, and Hades Town. Uh, and what was really a lot of fun to, to see is there's nothing like coming home from a field trip with a bunch of music kids because <laughs> all they do is sing. Um, and there was, <laughs> could be good, could be bad, depends on the chaperone. Um, there were, uh, but what was really neat is the, the excitement that y you hear on the bus and then the conversations that start from that and they start critiquing the show. Did you like this person's voice and how did you like the set? So it's really nice for them to get out and see a lot of the, um, the, the quality work that is, is in our area and, and get them inspired to, to go see more live theater. Um, on the uh, fine arts side of things, we successfully held our 24th Fine Arts Festival. Uh, there was artwork that was from across the district on display. There were performances from ensembles ranging from the elementary level all the way up to the high school. There was a production of Ash to a Flame and our TV production course had a chance to show off some of their work from, the, uh, from this past year. Uh, also, Kira mentioned that we had our Pops concert, which was successfully done uh, in the beginning of May. Uh, and over the past two weeks, we've had five in-house elementary school concerts and two evening community concerts. Uh, what was really nice and special about this is this was Larry Smith's uh, retirement tour. <laughs> so um, Larry had a chance uh, to be recognized after 30 plus years of educating our, our kids here in Norwood, and we are deeply going to miss him. He was um, a, a phenomenal educator, and, and we are we are the better for having him. Um, we had a wonderful sixth grade concert last night. We have another concert, seventh and eighth grade tomorrow night at the Copley, um, along with several high school drama performances this upcoming Thursday and Friday. Uh, and those are both student directed. Um, there are several different variations, uh, along with the sh uh, show that John's directing on Thursday uh, and Friday. And then the year will end in rhymes and bright colors next week uh, when the uh, CMS musical Susical takes place at the high school stage. And that'll close out our 2022-23 school year of uh, performances and events. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Mm -hmm. yeah, You're welcome. I have to say I'm very excited to see Susical at the high, uh, is at the high school. The last time I think it was yeah. at the middle school. It was here, I think, at the Savage when my daughter was in it. I can't even tell you how many years ago, and that was it's going to be so much better on a better auditorium. And, and you're probably <laughs> still singing all those little songs. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was adorable. So it, it, it just can, yeah. it's it's always great to see them the, do, do the junior Excellent. versions. Oh, and not to spill the, the, the beans, but we are doing Matilda in the fall. So if you're cool. up to theater, we're doing Matilda in September at the high school. Very nice. Looking Thank forward you. to that. Excellent. There's always a good production from the fall musical. <coughs> Thank well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a fabulous summer. Dr. Thompson, Cheers. can I ask, um, I know we're always trying to find ways to celebrate more. Um, could we push out the, the list that um, Mr. Longley shared with us and then also the list that Mr. Carr just read and help our community, who does not faithfully watch the school committee meetings, um, yes. celebrate with us? <laughs> this is, this is must-see CB, CTV, yes. Um, <laughs> to some of us, not yes, to everybody. Yes, we can do that. Uh, Mr. Kerr would have to share his secret with us. Yeah. Yes. Just email them and ask for yeah. okay. <laughs> All right, good. Don is on it. Okay. Thank you. Just shared it. Thanks. You're all right. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. All right, you're good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. So next on our appearances is Ms. Bourgeois going to talk to us about, uh, give us an EL update. Yeah. 
Good evening to everybody. Happy Wednesday. Um, as mentioned, I'm here to give our kind of annual update for the English Language Education Program for Norwood. Um, thank you for having me here this evening as we discuss um, updates on our program and steps moving forward. Um, I often start with a quote and just the opportunity to read this quote and just to be thinking about and reflecting upon as we um, hear what I have to say tonight and what I have to share, but also as we think about our students that we service directly. Language is the roadmap of a culture. It tells you where its people come from and where they are growing. Um, author Rita Mae Brown. So again, hold on to that. So our role, um, so we have the oversight of the ELE program, supports and services for pre-K all the way through 12th grade. Um, in this role, we oversee identification, assessment, and programming for our ML students, coordinating, developing, and implementing our EL programming, collaborate with the English Language Parent Advisory Council, building principals and district administration on relevant ELE-related issues, um, managing and submitting and monitoring of Title III and Title III 186 grant activities, um, the general budget of planning and implementation for PD opportunities, curriculum resources, and technology software, and then providing guidance and support for children who are experiencing homelessness. Um, areas of focus that we're going to discuss this evening are our staffing updates. Um, I want to recognize all of our teachers and paraprofessionals that are in the ELE department for this current school year. Um, talk a little bit about our shifting preschool to 12th grade multilingual population. Um, share some highlights from our Access 2023 testing window. Professional development that has been happening in all schools throughout this school year. Um, give an update on our SIMP, our Coordinated Improvement Monitoring Plan. Uh, talk about what activities and programs are being provided through grant funding. Um, an update on our translation interpretation services for the district, and last would be our next steps moving forward. So um, our students are number one priority, and right after them are our teachers and our paraprofessionals and all of the amazing adults that service our students day in and day out. And I wanna take a moment to recognize each of the English language teams at all of our buildings. Um, we at the Ball School currently have Emily Donovan, Elizabeth Goldberg, Nicole Janelle, Diana Martucci, and Fatina Karapidis. At the Callahan, Naza, Maj Naza Majid, Deirdre Scotina, and Arabella Adams. Over at the Cleveland, our team is Tennille Brennan, Ellen Lazry, Deirdre Scotina, and Rosemarie Petchel. Deirdre works in both buildings this year. Oldham. We have Kathleen Golden, Mary Kate Patterson, and Wafa Curdy. Over at the Prescott, we have Catherine Platt and Molly Sinis. Our middle school, we have Chelsea Evan Young Kay, Toby Lewin, Diane Lockwood, and Leila Diaz Adoro. At the high school, we have Nate Cameron, Donna McTavish, Joey O'Connor, and Audrey Busa. At the Willet, we have Jocelyn Brunner, Heather Folan, Heather Guild, and Katherine Dickerson. So a great team that, um, and for those of you who've been with the district for some time, it has extremely exploded <laughs> and gotten bigger and continues to grow. Um, but we are very fortunate, I am very fortunate to work with all of these amazing educators. It makes my job easier, it makes my job joyful to do each day, and um, it's a wonderful, wonderful group, and I thank them for their continued service to our students. So looking at the population, Provided some information just, just showing growth over the last five to six years, um, and these are in percentages um, of based on what the population representation of the whole student body. Um, some takeaways, there was the year after COVID or the initial shutdown that we did see a decrease in our student population. Um, number of factors could have impacted that. Um, access to school, the um, less people moving into the communities because of many um, restrictions on travel and moving ability. So those, were, those are some real big ones from them. Um, 
we the 2022 to 23 column is representative of our most recent SIMS data up, update. And then that's why I added the last column just to show that since March we've increased almost in all schools the percentage of students. Um, Oldham has more than doubled their population over the past six years. And again, there has been a steady increase in um, this population <coughs> since 2017 to 2018. And I'm happy to take questions as we go or we can wait until the end. I'm flexible. <laughs> Um, some celebrations for Access 2023. We are exiting 64 students across the district, uh, typically from second, more third grade up to 12th grade. Um, it is not advisable to uh, fell or exit a child in kindergarten and first grade because they're still at the very early stages of literacy development. Um, so we do wait um, until we have more data and get to know them more. And then, um, we do have, so that represents almost 13% of our existing multilingual population will be entering the former English language um, status. When they go into that, as a reminder, they are continued to be monitored for four years by the EL teachers. So each EL teacher team at each school has a large caseload, and then especially at the secondary level, because they're monitoring students for four years, um, we are currently monitoring 226 students. So if we think about that, in addition to our current population, which is around 560, um, we have a large population of students that we're overseeing. Um, teachers gather reports as part of that progress monitoring. So I do know a survey or a form goes out at the secondary level that the classroom content teacher area, content area teachers complete um, and it's solely so that we can make sure our students are able to access the content without language support specifically for English. Can I ask a quick question sure. on the slide before with all of the, the population? Yes. That the slide with is that the percent that is currently um, eligible for services under the okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and the LMPA will it is so high and also increased because we, um, we're still screening preschoolers. So preschoolers, um, until I came, were not being screened and they were supposed to be starting screening in 2017 as part of the Look Act. So we made sure to address that immediately and I'm fortunate to have um, a great collaboration now with Dr. Quigley and Michael, even last year with Stephen, Bull um, Stephen Billhart. And we were able to train the kindergarten EL teachers to come over to the preschool and do those assessments with those students. Right now, we are just required to gather that data. We don't have to provide them with any type of service, um, but it kind of allows us to see what's coming up the pipeline. Um, I do know that currently the Office of Language Acquisition is looking at the preschool um, identification process and we I just completed a survey this week so they're collecting information from all the municipalities to kind of determine what that's going to look like in the future um, kind of really we're not right now required to reassess them going into kindergarten so that might shift um, I personally am a proponent of that because a lot can happen from a child who's being screened at the age of three to the child two years later as a five-year-old, and I think that would give us more quality data. Mm -hmm. um, so that was what I, how I answered the survey. <laughs> um, or to get a, do away with it altogether was the other option because all of the children are learning English essentially at that age. Any other questions on that? All right. Um, so a lot of professional development has happened in the schools this year with more to come. Um, the biggest focus right now has been for SEI instruction kind of refreshers um, and to also discuss more integration in the schools. Should I keep talking? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sorry. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> Got a note, note that the, this is the meeting of technical the TV okay. sound wasn't working. For yes. me. I was quickly notified. Hey, tell them the sound's not coming through. So I'm just okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know the technical difficulties today are just going to kill us. But um, please do continue. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
so for the school committee, you also you obviously received this packet a couple days ago, so access is there to look at any of these presentations or a PD that was uh, delivered at all of the schools. Um, not all of them this year. I've done did some last year, and then really, as we'll go through on next steps, there's more work to be done at the secondary level. Um, but a lot of efforts to refresh classroom teachers, content area teachers on SEI appropriate strategies for students. Many of our educators went through the SEI endorsement training or classwork more than 10 years ago. And at that time, um, there was a much smaller population of ELs, so the opportunity to really practice and hone those skills really wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And then over these last three to five years with this huge influx, um, it's clearly in demand, but also with that demand requires um, those of us to provide them with the education to support those. Mm -hmm. So that is where a lot of those efforts are being made. Um, also to consistently be providing and um, sharing research of the importance of our EL students remaining in their classrooms and less standalone um, or more of a fashion term of pull out. Um, services and more integration or the old term push in into the classroom setting. Um, we have more data than ever before of the importance of that and the ability to acquire English when you are in the surroundings of native English speakers and you're also hearing the curriculum content from that those specialists in those areas um, firsthand. Lisa, quick comment yes. before you. I, I appreciate that you gave us the links to, to all of those. And, and I did spend some time looking, and I thought what was um, especially impactful was seeing the survey responses from mm -hmm. the staff after they went through the PD. Mm -hmm. So to know that staff took the time to reflect and consider how are they going to take that training and implement it. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but like teachers wrote about feeling like more empowered and, and, and being more creative and how they were adapting what they were teaching to the student. They were talking about meeting the student where they are, respecting the student, seeing their growth potential. You know, they talked about sharing what they were teaching the kids with the family and taking it one step further into the community. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to highlight some of that because as you're sharing with us, I don't know that the community truly understands the significance of this work. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to highlight it. Thank you and thank your staff. Um, for reflecting and implementing these important strategies. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, an update on our SIMP. So as you know, we uh, kind of came in toward the second part of the TFM when I first started in the district in uh, 21, 22 school year. Uh, we were assigned with three particular areas to provide evidence and data to support our progress in those areas. The first slide here is about ELE criterion number five. Um, and this, as is listed, are the next kind of steps. So up until this point, our progress report is approved. And then for the last submission of the school year, which will be on the last day of school for our district, um, is this continuation of evidence that I will supply to them. I would say our curriculum is definitely continuing into the summer and is more ongoing work. Um, so I'll be able to add to that. And um, in regards to staffing, we already approved uh, through FY24 budget to additional teachers for the elementary level so that we're showing that we are addressing our needs based on our increasing population. For ELE criterion. Uh, number 14. Um, again, up until that point, the progress report has been approved. The next part of this is just to make sure that, or that we're making every effort to get to 100% of our staff. Um, SEI endorsed, we're, we have got about six that are all in process. Um, a couple probably by now have received full endorsement and a few others are just waiting on coursework to finish up from this current uh, semester if you want to call it or some uh, based on their programming that they're involved in might end this summer so we are making great progress in that area but uh, we are required to have all of our teachers when servicing and providing instruction to a student who is identified as an English learner that staff member in front of them that educator has to have SEI endorse, um, endorsement as part of their license 
uh, SEI endorsement does not uh, expire like our teaching licenses, they carry along with you. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also why it's so important to provide the refreshers and check-ins. The last criterion, and I just noticed a, a typo, is ELE criterion number 18. This one is specifically um, about our multilingual student folders. Um, I would, again, like to recognize the ELE teachers who have maintained folders for the last many years. Um, they really just needed to be cleaned up, and that has been a massive um, administrative undertaking this year. We've been very supported by building administration, central office, uh, 217 in the, in the building here was filled with folders for a few months um, because just like a cumulative folder, they need to be behind lock and key, um, but we were able to go in, we created a system, and now all of those folders will look uh, similar to each other and so that when someone needs to go into that folder to reference it, their documents are in the same order, chronologically, reverse chronologically with checklists. There's also a record log. So um, I will, over the next week, be going into schools just to do some spot checks. Mm -hmm. um, typically when TFMs are done, a team from DESE comes out, but maybe for the next time, obviously it was during COVID and they weren't, um, but we wanna really make sure that we don't get cited on that again. I feel like we're in really good shape for this. Okay. Um, grants, uh, so as part of my role is to also manage our Title III funding and um, also the Title III 186 grant. The 186 is specific to immigrant students. Um, so part of that over the last um, year and a half, two years almost, we've been able to add a multilingual homework club, adult English classes. Uh, we have the Multilingual Summer Academy. This is also how our EL paraprofessionals are um, salaried. We have been able to send teachers to the Matsal Conference and again professional development for EL teachers and then other collaborations I wanted to recognize are, are we are definitely benefiting from the extended learning time grant with um, the first time ever uh, afternoon summer fun program and other enrichment opportunities and then ESSER 3 is also allowing us to offer a second year of summer English language screening for new students. So I'll talk about each of those individually. Multilingual Homework Club has a second year offering of this program. We did 11 weeks in the fall and then um, another five this past session. The reason of the, um, the change, in time, change in time, change in length, is because um, there's a time frame there that uh, MCAS clubs mm -hmm. are offered for helping with prep for certain students and we find often that it's impact or they're both programs kind of are attractive to the same set of kiddos mm -hmm. so rather than double dip and try to you know we try to use our resources better and more efficiently um, I waited and worked with the school principals on that and we just did the five-week session um, it's targeted toward fourth and fifth grade students and it's two days a week directly after school for one hour and at that time families are, um, a, they're the ones who have to pick up their students from the program. Mm -hmm. We, as seen here, we have the attendance of students that participated in the fall as well as our participants in the spring. Um, the Callahan and Prescott, we weren't able to get staffing. Again, um, we have to be really careful of staff burnout. Um, so a lot of those teachers who did the fall session also did MCAS prep, so they were they were ready to not do something else, which was okay. <laughs> um, but we were still able to offer it in three other schools, which was great. We'll continue to do that. Um, I want to also recognize a group of teachers there that taught this year for our multilingual homework club. Over at the Balsh, Alan Norton, Mary Welch, and Marlene Antis. At the Cleveland, we had Deirdre Slotina. Molly Sinis at the Prescott, Caitlin, L Caitlin Lang and Kathleen Golden at Oldham, <coughs> Jennifer Market, and Catherine Lee um, with the Callahan. We uh, also just are finishing up our second session of this year for our adult English classes, which is so exciting. We started this um, back when I first started and it had already been a brainchild of a few of the teachers over there along with um, the support of Diane Ferreira at the Balsh and I really was able to just come in, find the funding and do kind of the organizational side of it 
And so we this year successfully offered two sessions at 10 weeks each. Again, um, this program meets once a week at the Ball School. We extended it for an extra 30 minutes this year. Last year was 60, this year was 90. Um, Co-teachers Sandy Poulter and Ellen Norton have been the main teachers of this program so far. They develop the curriculum and they provide the instruction each week. The languages representative so far have been Portuguese, Spanish, and Arabic for our families that come. Um, in addition, the success of this attendance has been greatly um, in successful because families are able to bring their children. We mm -hmm. wanted to kind of be able to provide wraparound services, so we work with the high school and have high school volunteers. They're able to use that as their community service hours. Many of them themselves are multilingual students, so they're able to communicate with the teacher, uh, the, some of the students that are in the classroom. So we have some high school students that work in the classroom, and or we have a group of students that go and take the children down to the gym so that they can run around and play and have fun while their family members are upstairs learning English. It's really wonderful to see and witness. Um, and it's not just parents, it's family members of Balsh families. Um, so we've had grandparents, we've had cousins, so we are, we're really excited about it. And um, again, we had an increase with four additional adult learners this past spring. Just wondering, Lisa, about, uh, I think the last time we talked about this, it, there was gonna be a look at whether or not it could be done at other schools, and I didn't know where, that, where things were at with that. Sure, so absolutely, it's funding. Yeah. So um, I, because this is grant funded currently, we'll continue to go there. I will be honest, our Title III funding decreased this year, mm -hmm. um, not because of our population decreasing, that obviously increased, but because the overall EL population across the state of Massachusetts has increased. So funding has been dispersed to more, to more communities, yeah. greater numbers, because we get that, that's federal funding money, and then obviously it goes based on off that. So, uh, yes, the goal is to expand it across the district and or just be able to expand it to probably maybe two sites and increase the number of students so more teachers, right? Like I don't think yeah. we need to really spread out our structure too right. much, but um, it's more like I would love to have a beginner class, an intermediate class, and an advanced class so yeah. we can really start to tier the, the, the learners so that students that started with us last year are making that progress and are able to go into a higher tiered class. Yeah. Um, but it's grant funding, so continuing to research that. I have one on my list that hasn't opened yet that could have a potential for us um, to be eligible for uh, from the federal government, so. Yeah, I think there's something nice about these family members getting to see their students, see their child's environment, but if it's not practical and we need to, and we can get more people into, you know, one or two locations, then that's probably still a bigger win, right? Yes, 100%. Good luck. Keep Thank you. <laughs> yeah, keep trying. Do you see any grants that might be yeah, like, oh, yeah. send them my way. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Um, the Multilingual Summer Academy, we are in our second year of that, or about to be this summer. Uh, the program this summer will be running from July 10th to August 3rd. We meet four days a week, no classes on Friday. Students arrive at 8 o'clock in the morning and classes go until 1.30. We um, have the same exact um, time frame of programming as Summer Matters, which is our literacy Title I program, and then Coakley Connects, which is up at, for our rising sixth graders. And um, students are um, provided with breakfast opportunities and lunch opportunities and they'll have recess. And our students that come to the Multilingual Summer Academy are primarily our newcomers and or our level one um, students who are at the very early stages of learning English. Many of them either arrived to our district within the last school year, um, and many have arrived newly to our country as well. Um, the focus during that session is on the four language domains of speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Um, last year we did a thematic-based curriculum because it's just more engaging and fun for the kids. Um, last year we talked about animals and animal habitats and then at each grade level we had a culminating activity or presentation and we celebrated that with um, each grade group sharing with their peers. 
Um, so we plan to do that again this year. Last year was only two weeks. This year we'll have it for four weeks. Um, again, receiving this additional funding from the ELT grant has been awesome. Thanks to Dr. Taylor um, for writing that grant. And we are, we are over 60 students as of today. So um, we are doing really great with that. I have six teachers hired for that. So very, very exciting work that's being done there. And we'll help with um, time out of school, you know, those time out of school minutes and having um, students the, with the, giving them the opportunity to be around the English language. And we um, work really closely, I work really closely with Stephanie West, who's the coordinator for the Summer Matters program, to find opportunities where we can um, work together. So our kids will go to specials together, they'll have lunch together, they'll have recess together. So we, we try to navigate that too, so that the kids can have that um, inclusion opportunity. Which building does that? Coakley. Is that just elementary in the Summer Academy? Yes. Yeah. K through five or one through five? Rising one through five. Okay. Yeah. It's still yeah. the quickly this summer? The construction? Yes. Oh. We'll all be there. <laughs> we will all be there. We will all be there. We will all nope. be there. It's a big party. I was under a different understanding, but okay. Yes. Um, We've gone around that barn three times. Before. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are fortunate to also provide transportation um, to and from. Um, pickups are at the school sites as well as the large apartment complex across the community so that families do not have to worry about that if they're unable to have um, transportation um, options for their children. So again, that's 8 to 1.30. Um, the piggyback to that is that this is the first year we're able to offer the um, afternoon summer fun, we're calling it, and this is for students um, that are attending the Multilingual Summer Academy as well as Summer Matters. Um, right now, we are offering it to um, all of the Multilingual Summer Academy students and percentages of students from the Summer Matters um, as part of the registration process. We kind of uh, Stephanie West gathered data from those families to kind of in, uh, gauge whether or not who needed what for that extended day. Um, would extended day allow your child to even go to the Summer Matters program in the morning? Would that be helpful for you? So um, a lot of those types of questions. So we're hoping to have a little over 100 kids for that program. That'll be from 1.30 to 4.30. We have a separate site coordinator for that, a separate staff for that. Um, we are also providing buses home from that program for families and they will do a variety of um, games and fun activities um, inside and outside the Coakley area. So we're really excited to be doing that for the first time this year. Um, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, just some other grant highlights. I know I went a little out of order there, but um, this is the second year teachers are attending the Matsall Conference. It's actually going on right now for this year. So today and tomorrow, virtually, our teachers are attending. They're given the option to go. Um, again, this is just high quality professional development for teachers working with English learners. Um, also this year, our K-8 to teachers all participated in this course called Practical Co-Teaching Strategies to effectively support your ELLs in inclusive classrooms. Um, this was a great PD opportunity for them because it is right in line with our overall vision of having more inclusive opportunities and um, ability for our students to be more inside the classroom versus outside of the classroom. And uh, I mentioned this a little earlier, but we are having our second summer of three days of English language screening to be administered during the month of August for new students. Um, we have seen, and based on my own history as an ESL teacher for 10 years prior to coming here, um, it is a very um, typical trend that we get more students over the summer that are students who typically, um, English is not their first language, so allowing the students the opportunity to be screened during the summer months really helps with our administrative responsibilities at the start of the school years. Mm -hmm. So this basically allows our EL teachers to get to their students sooner, to start teaching groups sooner, and have to spend less time screening students um, because it is a lengthy process. Um, and we are required um, to assess our students within 10 days of attendance uh, to school 
and notification has to be sent to families within that um, within 30 days as well. So this really helps that time frame. Mm -hmm. I just want to comment really quickly because I uh, on the grants because we were scrutinized and still are scrutinized so intently for our budget, and everything that you just spoke to us about for like the last ten minutes isn't even in the operating budget, and they are services for our children who need and deserve these services, and our multilingual population is increasing, and you said Lisa that our Title III funding decreased because the overall need in the state has increased. So the federal government hasn't said, oh wow, Massachusetts, your whole need is increasing, let me give you more money. Maybe the money went up a little bit, but then it had to be dispersed across the state. Right. So our need went up, our state funding went down. You, Dr. Taylor, Ms. Sheridan, so many others are working so diligently to bring in these other grants. And this is all above and beyond mm -hmm. our operating budget. Yes. So for anybody who wants to continue to scrutinize the budget of the school committee and the school district. Come talk to me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> or you, or Dr. Taylor, or Sheridan, or all of us. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. <laughs> okay, not Ms. Sheridan. They can come talk to me. Yeah, Karen And it's true. I, and the majority of our Title III grant is for EL Power Professional salaries. Yeah. So, having that responsibility is hard because it is, while that obviously directly impacts our students, it decreases our ability to expand on some of the programming and offer other programs. So there's pluses and minuses to that, um, but you are correct. All of those things I just listed were all great related <laughs> um, pieces. A um, couple last things are that the um, we transitioned this year to Lexikeet language services. Um, we were using telelanguage, which is now known as Propio. Um, we are officially going to be not using that anymore as of July 1st. Um, we just had a, a little bit of a slower transition out of that programming, uh, out of that service. And this year, one of the reasons is um, Lexikeet offers more opportunities for us to provide translation services for our families. For example, Dr. Frazick at her um, rising sixth grader um, open house uh, last week, we were able to have Lexikeet on board with us with our top kind of languages that we needed knowing of our families to um, be able to simultaneously translate for our families so what that looks like for us on an infrastructure side and working with Joe Kidd is making sure that we have enough Chromebooks and headphones for families so that when they come in, um, they're able to put those headphones on. Lexikeet has it set up so that you can choose the language and there's an interpreter on the other end who's simultaneously translating the words of Dr. Fezzik. Um, we've done that. I used it at the LPAC earlier this year and then we used it um, online. I've used it a couple times and so that's a really amazing feature mm -hmm. and each time we do it we're learning um, and reflecting on how we can increase usage. We also think this was, will increase participation um, with our community members so we're, we're navigating that as well but um, it's certainly exciting because it's giving more access to more people in our community that, um, especially based on our shifting demographics. Um, we went through a big training for um, certain groups of teachers that would primarily be using their services for, say, parent-teacher conferences, special ed meetings, um, any type of administrative related conversations, nurses, guidance counselors. So those were all staff members that were tra uh, immediately translated. They all have access to um, setting up and making an appointment with translators. The other reason I really wanted to switch to this platform was so that we could um, gather data on usage based on per building, per staff. We weren't able to do that with the previous program. Mm -hmm. um, the the process was send an email with your document or send an email and make, or, or I'm sorry, it would be a live call and you just called and it was on demand, which is, is great. Um, mm -hmm. Lexikeet also has this, but this allows teachers and staff members to set up an appointment 
and then I can look and see data usage so that we can make sure that we're using the program efficiently and effectively, um, but also where is the need and where is it being utilized the most. Mm -hmm. So that'll be fun and interesting to kind of watch and observe over the next couple of years. Um, yeah, and I right now am the only person in the district who has access to be able to send translation requests off to Lexikeet, and so far that's been fine. Um, people just ask and send what they need. I, there's a certain format, and then I just send it along. Um, again, we're able to monitor that so that I can see um, by department who's ordering what and who needs what. So we can, again, continue to watch that. That is um, in the general budget, so it's helpful to have that information. <laughs> so can you give an example of how that would be used, say, by like a, a general teacher or um, in, a, in a classroom? Like, so would she request, or they would request um, to have some materials translated through you to Lexiki, or is the idea that Jeff at some point they're going to people can access the key directly and so that's two questions <laughs> it's okay <laughs> um currently all the users that have been identified are those that have gone through the training okay. um so we could realistically give it to everybody but it's it was kind of it wasn't suggested yeah. or recommended by lexikey to do that that first go around and so far the teachers if it is a classroom teacher there's already a um, a coordination and a collaboration with the EL teacher or a special educator or a, read, a reading specialist or the nurse that that communication is already in place and knows the best way to communicate so whoever that person is they're setting up the appointment um, and then Lexikeet has a specific link they email it to you the user and then that user can just copy the link and send it to whoever needs it so that's how we communicate to the parents so it's not a Google, the Google Meet platform, it's their own platform that we use, but it would be used for, of course, parent-teacher conferences. Mm -hmm. In regards to any written translation requests, primarily those are your handbooks, um, nurse health forms, mm -hmm. district-wide right. yeah. items. Those are our more formal documents, whether it's an ed plan, um, any types of reports that we have to put up on the website, um, public notice things, all those types of areas, but general informal communication, like a newsletter, that can be done through Google um, Translate. Google Translate has made strides over the last 10 to 15 years in regards to their... Um, and Parent Square has the ability yes. as well. So Parent Square it. has been an awesome added um, communication uh, item for our district this past year. And as long as the content in the email, right. can't that can be translated. Yeah. But if there's any attachments that aren't already translated, they can't do that. Um, so we regularly remind staff of that. Yeah. Um, and that also, I didn't list that in next steps, but those are some healthy reminders that mm -hmm. I'm going to be providing to staff next year. Um, and just being a little bit more conscious of providing more items in children's preferred or family's preferred language. Mm -hmm. I worked with Steph Bowden at the beginning of this current school year so that on Aspen when you pull up a student on that there's like a front page mm -hmm. and we have that column right there for preferred language mm -hmm. so that you can quickly see it without having to open up the student's file or going to certain tabs right. so it's Easy. right there yeah. yeah because we do have a large population of families who do right. re request that yeah. it's another language and not English. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to just make sure that we're trying our best to do that. Right. So Lex keeps more about the, the meetings, family meetings. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. Or these meetings presentations. Are, uh, yeah. Legal documents. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks. You're welcome. But most certainly for parent-teacher conferences, like that's the big, the big win. Um, also. Unlike telelanguage, um, telelanguage was an on-call option, but there was no face to the translator or the interpreter. So now we can actually have a video call. So often I'm walking around with my Chromebook and we have a person there. So now I have some consistent um, interpreters that I've used with families this year, which is really nice That's and it creates huge, yeah. just um, a more familiar relationship. It's um, well, interpretation is more heartfelt. Body language, like yeah. language is not just yeah. words, right? So, yeah. 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 
And depending on the topic of those conversations, I think having a face to the, yeah. to the language, to the words coming out is more intimate. Right. Yeah, so that's been a really nice added feature. <coughs> I apologize. I'm looking at my phone because I didn't print the last <laughs> slide. Um, so for next steps, um, and thank you, Teresa, for because she had asked this question, but we are hiring um, new, two new elementary EL teachers for the Balsh. Uh, there will be a 1.0 there, and then a 1.0 that will be shared between Cleveland and Prescott. That has already been approved in the FY24 budget. Um, we will explore further grant opportunities to expand our adult English program, um, continuing to provide SEI refreshers, professional development for secondary levels um, by buildings and departments, continue our SEI review, scaffolding curriculum for newcomers level one and level two students, PD for elementary by buildings. Um, there also will be a continued uh, ask for an e some more support for the EL program department, because um, I am it. <laughs> um, we will continue to develop and add to our ELE curriculum. We will further establish, train, and promote inclusion across all grade levels in all buildings for that integrated learning time for our L students with less standalone instruction. We are going to be implementing the Elevation platform, and I can talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, we are, well, I will be working with um, administrators to create a homelessness subcommittee from our um, administrative team. And then, as always, the ongoing review of staffing needs based on our increasing EL population. Um, the Elevation platform, um, thankfully, was approved in our general budget for this year um, for FY24. And Elevation is a program that will allow us to collect all of the data for our students in one place. You ask any EL teacher, or EL coordinator, or anybody, we have spreadsheets like you wouldn't believe it. And a lot of it is because of the data we have to keep for our students. It isn't just one score. Um, it isn't just one data point. And it's a lot, it has to do with the different levels that they're at in re regards to learning English. It has to do with what language domain they need some focus on. We also have to write multilingual student success plans for students. We talked about that the last time I was here. So this program will be able to speak to Aspen, which gets all, you know, from Renaissance, every, all the, our, our data points that we collect throughout the year from our different benchmark assessments will go to one place. So this will really help with our um, data collection and data distribution of our EL students. It'll also help with writing our student success plan reports. So we're really excited about that. As part of us purchasing this, we will all go through a training to use that EL platform, um, and it will be accessible by all EL teachers in the district. Um, and then I do know there was a question about the homelessness group. So we have recently in Norwood, um, a scattered site was located, uh, was um, not located, <laughs> was open to um, some new families. And knowing that there is a homelessness crisis in the state of Massachusetts currently, and we are also being impacted by that directly in Norwood, um, we strongly feel as an administrative team to create the subcommittee. We are at the very, very early stages of that. Um, we haven't even we haven't established who's on that. We have some interest from people, but it's to take a proactive approach to figure out how we can put all these resources in one place. Um, with a scattered site, they're um, coming in with some state support so that there are social workers and case workers that are available. They're not there 24 seven um, because they go to different locations, but they're able to help families kind of get up and running and help them to the most important things like food security and clothing, um, get them situated with um, the school systems that they're living in. But we are seeing an increase there um, and there could be more um, units opened to more families. We're we're in regular communication with those individuals. And then we are also in kind of the moratorium with, in regards to the rents and evictions. So we're seeing an increase in that as well. And it's a great need. And um, when this happens to families and our students, most importantly, it is very impactful on their day to day and it does cause some trauma. So not just for the students, but for our students who are in this in the schools when this happens 
and um, for our teachers and our staff. So we really want to be thoughtful and mindful about how we can pull those resources together and respond to that need mm -hmm. for our community and be more proactive about it versus a reactive situation. So, so far we're kind of all managing with um, the great assistance of Priscilla, who is our McKinney Bento liaison for the district. I happen to have a lot of historical experience um, from previous roles I've had in this um, in the state in regards to this. So having some connections at the state level has been really helpful, and we've been able to get some families placed under emergency circumstances. But it's it's certainly a great need, and it's somewhere where we want to put some of our attention on. Mm -hmm. And Thompson, if I could ask, as Lisa, as we figure out what this subcommittee is going to be looking like, um, it might be helpful to have Lisa join us in a budget meeting over the summer if she can. Um, because this is something we've been talking about. This is something that we need to share with the budget balancing committee. This is something that Ms. Sharon and I were just working on in terms of the strategic plan. And this also touches on a conversation that Jody Smith and I just had with Representative Rogers. So I think the school committee needs to be pretty involved and aware of, of the work both ways. Sure. That's what I have for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. You're very welcome. Any other questions? Anything I can help with? Okay, well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we asked all of our questions during the presentation. Which <laughs> okay. May or may not have been efficient, but they're out there. Okay. But thank you very, very You're much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. We have next Dr. Frasic for a twofer. I've <laughs> <laughs> discussing the next year's Washington, D.C. trip first. So we are excited to get back to doing not just small field trips, but the big ones. Um, working with a new company that we're uh, piloting out with our New York trip. They've been fabulous. They have like the coolest little app that you download and it shows like, I'm, I'm not going to New York, unfortunately, but um, I still can watch exactly what they're doing all the time. And, uh, their Hummingbird is the name of the company. Um, they're local, which is also really nice as well. And um, just been really, really fabulous. So I'm excited to, to see what they can do for us. Um, I've included the itinerary, although we still will tinker with it a little bit. Um, like one of the things that this is sort of their standard itinerary. Um, they have like Mount Vernon on there, which we haven't done in a couple of years, mostly because we like to replace it with the African American History Museum mm -hmm. for the Smithsonian. Um, add a little bit more time in Smithsonian's and museums and things like that. Um, do the Holocaust Museum because they tie a little bit more closely to the work that our students are doing. Obviously, they do a ginormous civics project. There is a lot of trifolds at my school right now. Um, so this will certainly be a really nice culminating event. Um, and we'll do a lot of work for um, scholarships, for fundraising, because it's really important that we um, try and get as many people as we can on there. Um, mm -hmm. My dream is that some magical person will suddenly just give me like $200,000 <laughs> <laughs> so I can take everyone. Say it louder. Say it louder. Anybody about there, man? <laughs> Some mad, maybe say it, I'll say it out there for the audience. Some magical person. Um, just, uh, you know, just anonymous donations. We take those, or not anonymous. We'll call it your name and put it on the side of the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, but, uh, on the bus. We'll the bus. <laughs> on the side of the bus. So, no, but we work, uh, you know, the PTO is helpful with that. Uh, we also just kind of, you know, we put some things out to the community in hopes that we can get people to, uh, like, sponsor sponsor a kid to go down. Um, cost is $825. We did look at EF, which we had used before. Um, they only fly now, which I'm like, well, that's really nice. Uh, so it was, like, $2,300. And I was like, that's not in, in my budget. Uh, so we went with uh, just one more reason that we like Hummingbird. I mean, who doesn't like? A nine hour bus trip with 13 and 14 year olds. Listen, it's a rite of passage. Just gotta. I'm just kidding. It's, uh, I've done that. <laughs> Approximately a couple dozen times. I think Mr. Kerr might have implied I earlier that they were say, singing. Like, he wants to be on that bus. <laughs> I was thinking, like, that man could be some fun on a bus. So, you know, we've, we've been known to do some karaoke and some sing alongs. I think my DC trip in eighth grade was the sickest I've ever been on a bus, so oh, no, no, don't see that. Well, so I'm saying it's, it's a long, happen. it's a long it ride. Happen. Yeah, no, never. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a lot of fun, and it's um, it, it is a really exciting trip. I know our families love it, our kids love it, so we're really excited to get back on board with it. Any, uh, questions? any questions on anything in our packets this evening around the trip? 
Dr. Thompson, did you forward my question to Dr. Fraser? <laughs> it's okay. So just um, in the packet, it references, um, let me find it, about like travel insurance and then also if the trip is canceled, but it said it was like optional. Is that something that is offered to our families to purchase? Yes. So there's two different things. There's one like there's the rider that the company itself holds, which yep. um, we always provide. But then yes, they do offer travel and insurance okay. for students, uh, for families. Okay. So they have to cancel it. Um, in particular, I think they kind of focus around COVID. Yep. Um, so that you know, if your student has COVID and you have to do it, you have, which has always been the case. But yes, they do offer that. Okay. And then um, some of the dates are wrong. So I was just. FYI, like, because it talks about payment being due in 22, 23, so that should be 23. Yeah. So I, I think this is a standard one they actually yeah. sent me quite some time ago. Um, this is always a preliminary one I send, because I, I don't have a list of students for you. I would just be right. printing out the entire current seventh grade. I don't have yeah. a full, you know, I've, I name the four chaperones that go every single time. So I, but we'll, there'll be more than four of us. So, um, so once, come next fall, I do this. Again, I don't necessarily come here, but I submit this again yeah. with actual okay. names, actual chaperones, the finalized yeah. itinerary, and all. Yeah, that, that's perfect. I just wanted you to touch on, like, if we approve it, there are things in the policy that you then follow up on. Yes. Just wanted you to cover that. Absolutely. That's what I was. Thanks. Anything else? Motion to approve. Moved by David. Second. Seconded by Teresa. I need to do roll call. Joan. Thanks, Joan. Hopefully, Joan. Yes. Hopefully John didn't go to sleep. <laughs> Teresa. Yes. Kate. Yes. David. Yes. And yes as well, so that passes five to zero. Thank you all. Thank you. And next, the middle school book. Um, we did not make any substantive changes to the overall handbook. The biggest thing was replacing sort of older um, or varied policies with these uh, more standardized school committee policies in various places. Um, we have updated the wellness policy to make sure that that's in there. I added the National Junior Honor Society um, criteria in there. Um, I did take a look at the disciplinary uh, stuff. Most of it is correct. I did add a passage that matches um, the new section that's referenced in the mental health law. I don't know however you want to put it. Um, so that's no abomination. I'm sorry. Uh, all that fun stuff. 37 H and three quarters. 37 H and three quarters. Because they, they don't know anymore. Actually, right. I guess. So. <laughs> I know so. I think I say this every time, but every time I hear that, I think of Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> um, that we're on platform nine and three quarters. It's just well, they're, they're not quite as fun. And, not, it's, and it's a magic fun. passage. It just ended up in a bill. So, right. I mean, I guess it goes great. <laughs> let's, let's, not, let's not go down the road of 37 H and three quarters. <laughs> Just trying to make light of it. And I, I should also note that I did add a bit about um, our RISE program. Right. Okay. That right. Nice. Thank you very much for the iterative process this, that this can be, especially with the, the policy cycle that we are trying to get into the rhythm of. So I think we'll hit a stride at some point. But uh, um, I think all the questions were answered that we had. So thank you very much. Um, and then you. Dr. Thompson adds a new letter, and then it. Yep. What's the I launch do. code on that? It just goes out to everybody, and then. Well, I basically, I basically rewrite the letter, July, August, and send them out to all the handbooks, and they stick it as a one page. Or that, that's just last year's letter is a place for them right now, but mm -hmm. they, the handbooks don't go out until September, so. Mm -hmm. a time. September. Yeah. So it goes up. It's available on the website at that time, and then. Yep. Um, to parents at any time, but they are um, sort of the beginning of the school year. Remind me, are people meant to like? Are we? Do we give them a heads up, like read this, yes. right? Yeah, okay. there's a there's a sign off. Page sign off. Of that, yeah. Is it still in Aspen? Is that still? Yes. Yeah, so you do it in Aspen. One thing actually, I've been to my school council talked about was um, that maybe people aren't looking at the entire handbook before they click a little button on Aspen oh. and send it in. I, just like I mean, I know you are. I know my parents are. I know you've read it. Well, I know you've read it from cover to cover, so. Um, <laughs> where? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to hedge that not everybody does. So yeah. one thing we talked about, so on, um, I think it's page, I, we, we kind of, a couple years ago, we did sort of a at-a-glance page. Yeah, so we're okay. planning on actually printing this out and sending it home. 
using that fancy lexicate stuff to translate yeah. it into multiple languages, just so we know something's going on that has yeah. kind of the, the big pieces on there. So. Right. The highlights. And then it gets the highlights. Right, yeah. the crib notes. Don't be in your I think that's really helpful, though, Margo. And I think, yeah. you know, I read it because I'm in the seat, right? <laughs> um, but I think a lot of people, and, and what I like about this and, and, and Dr. Gallagher's handbook and the work that we did with um, Dana Brown is we're also trying to help cross-reference to school community policy because I think a lot of people just don't understand how these things <laughs> intersect and where to look for resources. So we're taking the steps forward to make that clearer, and that's a point. And I think it's also nice that what we are doing is slowly the elementary, middle, and high school, while not exactly the same because we have different students and different needs, there's a sort of consistency or a through line right. so that there's you're not kind of bouncing from one thing to another. So I think that's more and more getting in that direction. Any other questions on this before we take a vote? Just something that I had asked over email, and I know it's like kind of handbook, but bigger. Um, and Dr. Thompson, you said maybe we readdress it in the fall. But as we figure out the Junior National Honor Society staffing piece, and then also at our last meeting, Mr. Longley, um, he had put his um, athletics handbook in the high school handbook and said he was going to be working on a middle school version of the athletics handbook. So if we could, I'm fine with approving this tonight, but if we could have a touch point maybe at our August meeting just to see if there is any update with yeah. the athletics handbook and the jun Junior National Honor Society. Right. Ju well, junior and National Honor Society probably will come back at that point in time. But the. Uh, <laughs> but Jonathan did share the middle school handbook from the MIAA. He suggested it get put on the CMS website. So that's okay. not necessarily Norwood's handbook. It's the it's the state handbook. But there is a he, he shared that with us. He shared that with me. Oh, could you pass that on to us? No, it's not here. <laughs> if I'll I can just go find, find it. it. If, if I can it. find <laughs> it. Um, but there. But he shared that link so that we could. Obviously, he's been involved with tournament games, so I'm not yep. sure that he has to on Margo and everybody else, but we'll follow up. Or I would definitely check the incredibly helpful MIA website. <laughs> oh my god, that thing is that. No, let's just not go there. <laughs> well, if I can, I'll make a motion to approve with the request that we also have a touch point on this handbook and those two items in our office meeting. I will second. Uh, and I will take a roll call. Joe? Yes. <laughs> Teresa? Yes. Kate? Yes. David? Yes. I have a yes as well, so that passes five to zero. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Fraser. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Fraser has been out of the has been out of the house quite a few nights this week too, with all the concerts and everything else that's going on. So. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just sitting here just waiting for the phone call. When are you? When are you coming home? <laughs> when, when are you? So we, we definitely appreciate you being here. Thank you. Uh, right I got to get home to decorate for a birthday. Oh my god, okay, so next up is Ms. Mino giving us a tiered focus monitoring update. And go. Okay, excellent. This so, will be super quick. Yeah, so, so you saw the slides. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so just to give you an update on our tiered focus monitoring for special education, um, our review year was 21-22. It has taken us this long to actually go through the real process with them. Um, and this uh, school year, we have been uh, participating in our SIMP, which is our um, Continuous Improvement Monitoring Plan. So just a timeline of events. Um, we did a self-assessment in January of 22. Um, it was put off a little bit because of my stuff going on and stuff going on in the district, so the state was gracious enough to let us move that um, up to January of 22. We did our on-site on April 28th. Um, we got a draft report in May. We got our SIMP report. Uh, I had to submit the SIMP report on June 30th. Um, and then we got our final report on July 12th. So I'm happy to report to you all that as of May 15th, we are in the clear. We have passed all of our progress reports and we are on to the next, next uh, portion of auditing from the state. <laughs> um, so just as a reminder, the three areas that we were cited in was age of majority for Norwood High School, um, excusal of team members from meetings, and immediate provision of IEPs and finding of no eligibility to parents. So those were the three key areas in which we have been um, undertaking professional development. So as part of our um, SIMP efforts, um, <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, we have had m multiple staff meetings where we utilize we use utilize the professional development in the areas of finding. Um, we've conducted record reviews after the professional development was completed to make sure that what was presented in the professional development was actually being implemented. Um, we have had follow-up follow up occurred um, on any non-compliance after the PD. So there were, um, I'll tell you specifically for age and majority, we did the professional development, we did the record review, there were still findings when we did our um, root cause analysis of the professional development of the record review. Um, so we went back and had to do more professional development around it. Um, and then the reports were all submitted to the DESD for review. So as of May 15th, we got this awesome email that let us know that all progress reports were submitted and approved. Um, our next scheduled review, because the special education um, portion of tiered focus monitoring is actually two sections now. It's group A and group B. We just completed group A. We'll be doing group B um, during the 24-25 school year. And at that time, they will be assessing licensure and professional development, parent-student community engagement, facilities and classrooms, oversight, time and learning, and equal access. So that one's a much heftier lift um, when we get there. So any questions? We do that in 2425. 2425. Just as we're trying to figure everything out with Oakney and Coakley. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I'll still be standing at that point. <laughs> yes. Yep. Just to recognize you for, and your staff for all your hard work, you know, even before the tier focus monitoring and then during it and then, you know, with the findings and implementing and no longer having them. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Have a good evening. You too. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Sure, runaway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we continue on to, uh, do we want uh, superintendent's report and late breaking? It's all choreographed. It's all choreographed, okay. Yeah, it's all right. choreographed, don't, don't you worry. Go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna invite um, Norway Teachers Association President Jody Smith up, and while she's moving up, going to talk, uh, start at the first of the list here. I just want to say again, congratulations to the class of 2023. Uh, we had a great graduation on Sunday, um, and, and uh, Dr. Gallagher and I were, were joking that he really got a feel for trying to call a snow day when he was trying to call a graduation amongst uh, a rainy weekend. Um, but we did manage, uh, he did a great job kind of squeezing in, moving up just a half an hour so that and I, as I was driving away and driving home, raindrop. So uh, we managed to nail that one. But one thing I want to comment, um, you know, looking back at seven seven years ago, really, because I I came to graduation when I was the superintendent elect, um, is is the difference in in that walking piece. So I can remember in that walking, there was a good portion of kids that were going into the workforce or exploring things after graduation. Uh, that's not what I heard uh, yesterday. Um, as Kira mentioned earlier, this was the first graduating class from our career pathways, the medical career pathways, and I believe almost every single one of those students is going into a healthcare field, be it nursing, be it uh, some sort of research around medical technology, be it health and food science, um, and you know we have we are sending them off not just with a high school diploma but, but with a high school diploma that is focused in on that the other thing that um, we have worked on and, and we have had this conversation about the students who go to Norwood and how many of them are first might be first generation college students and, and maybe college isn't the thing right away and what are they going to leave high school with to be able to make a living and what we heard and what was a major focus of the last year and a half was really hooking up with trades and unions and we heard a lot of that um, and you know it, 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 if kids haven't figured it all out that's okay but our job is to make sure that kids have some sort of direction uh, when they leave our high school and we're seeing you know, not just the college piece, but also 
vocational careers, military. And I can tell you every time I, I listen to um, those colleges and, and where kids are going, I am really impressed where they are. Uh, our guidance staff do an incredible job uh, helping these kids get where they want to go, and I want to mention them as well. Um, but, I'm, but I'm very proud of that evolution of you know, what comes out of Norwood High School. In reality, it's what comes out of our system pre-K through 12. Um, so we really have done that. Um, the middle school today just had a big career fair, uh, looking at different careers and having speakers come in and kids move around and hearing some of that. The Project Lead the Way uh, program, another year and a half, two years. We will, another two years, we will see kids that have done those, those engineering pieces, and it'll be interesting to see what, what kids are graduating from there. We are looking or trying to get a business career pathway up and running. Um, all those things are important because you, know, you can make a great living in the trades, you can make it if you go to college, but you know, these kids, every time you change majors, if it's a major change, it's at least a, another half a year, and college has gotten so, per, uh, so expensive, it, it is a major blow. So um, I want to compliment us as a district looking at that and, and, and making that um, improvement. So with that, uh, Mrs. Smith was supervising me and Dr. Wyatt last night at the uh, Norfolk County <laughs> Teachers Association Awards. And uh, Mrs. Smith wanted to uh, share some of the great news with you. So share some of my time and spotlight with you. Oh, Mrs. Smith. thank you for sharing. You know, I, I'm a good sharer. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, last night, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, um, we attended the banquet for the Norfolk County Teachers Association. And every year they have this wonderful banquet. There's about 500 plus educators all in one room, um, some of them behaving well and listening, others not so much. Um, however, um, each year we are asked to nominate two people, and one is an honor award, and the honor award is given to someone who supports education in many different ways. It has been um, nurses, it has been school committees. Um, we nominated the school committee one year um, when we had the override, I believe the override. And we have nominated custodians and so forth. This year our honoree was Dr. Alec Wyeth, who is not here this evening for me <laughs> to point to him. Um, so I'm gonna read a little, just a couple of little lines from what was submitted to Napa County Teachers Association. Um, Dr. Wyeth is dedicated to education and being a lifelong learner himself. He is always willing to try new things that will benefit our students. He always listens to teacher feedback and works hard to use data to drive new initiatives. His hard work and dedication has made a huge impact on the entire district. So that was Alec. Then we are asked to nominate a teacher for Teacher of the Year. And every year they present the Laura Walkup Award and that is in recognition and named for a former teacher and um, big time um, board member for Norfolk County Teachers, and she was from Walpole. So our nominee this year was Patty Doucette. Um, Patty has been a kindergarten teacher in Norwood since 1997. I was going to say 77, but <laughs> she would uh, be ready to retire. She'd be very happy to that. Yes, mm -hmm. and she's been lead teacher at the Willett School since it opened. Patty puts the lead in lead teacher as she always leads by example. Patty always welcomes a variety of learners into her classroom with open arms and works tirelessly to make sure their needs are being met. She loves and believes in every child. So that's why we nominate Patty. Uh, unfortunately, she did not win the um, honor. It was given to a gentleman from Walpole. Uh, this ragged. year, it, what, what was that? I said ragged. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we were thinking. Okay, and this year they started a brand new award. It's called the Rookie of the Year. So it is to highlight people that are in their early stages of their career, which I think is just magnificent. Um, this year we nominated Dan Quinn from the Cleveland. So Dan began at the Cleveland School as a first grade teacher in 2020 after years of being a paraprofessional. He has now moved to second grade. Dan also works as an after school MCAS tutor and universal design for learning coach and works every summer in our heroes camp. Dan goes above and beyond every day and especially embraces the students with special needs. 
He brings a passion for learning and excitement into his classroom, especially with his class pet, Polly. So everybody has to have a class pet. Um, the magnificent thing is Dan won. Oh. Yes, yes, yep. So Dan won the very first Rookie of the Year Award from Norfolk County Teachers. So uh, we were very excited, and last last night Norwood um, was very well represented. We had six tables, oh. and we were front and center. Normally, we're in the back corner. <laughs> so this year we were elevated. Well, that's because new, that's because they knew I was going to that, and everybody right. behaved. <laughs> when, <laughs> so we um, just because they <laughs> we got moved to the front. That, yeah. So thank you. I just wanted to share that exciting news about um, about our educators and awesome. and say thank you for all you do. Well, thank Jody, you. thank you for nominating Dr. Wyeth, and yeah. I think that's a great honor for him to have. Yes. And Mrs. Doucette is amazing, and Mr. Quinn, I know firsthand, um, he was a paraprofessional in my son's second grade class, Mrs. Huey. Can't quickly do the math whenever my son was in second grade. He's in sixth grade now. Um, <laughs> and, and I was the room parent that year, so I was in Mrs. Huey's room often, and, and Mr. Quinn was, I think, getting his master's at the time and was a year away from becoming a, a teacher, but even as the paraprofessional, he was absolutely amazing, and I saw it firsthand. Yeah, so, he very is, well he's he's a, a super, super he is guy, a super great teacher. addition to yeah. our staff. He yeah. really is. And it was our pleasure to nominate Alec. It really was. Awesome. So, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I would also like to mention uh, the building project. And again, the, you know, the fences are being set up. Uh, we already had it mentioned earlier that there is a groundbreaking next Tuesday. Uh, but I want to, and this was in my superintendent's newsletter as well, but there are building project information sessions that are going to be held uh, the first and third Friday of each month, starting the 16th. Uh, and those are at 10 o'clock in town hall in the finance room. So this is where you, this is where you as a community member can go and get updates on the construction pro process, you know, what's coming next? Are we bringing steel in? Are the HVAC people coming in? Um, usually people who live nearby are the major people who want to know that, but it is open for the entire community. Again, it's the first and third Friday of the month, starting on the 16th at 10 a.m. in Town Hall in the FinCon Road. Uh, family, uh, the family workshops, the SEL uh, workshops, uh, finished last, uh, last Wednesday, the 31st. Um, there is a um, list of resources uh, that the facilitator gave to us. Those are posted on the family resources section. This also went out via Parent Square, but I wanted to mention that. We are going to look at maybe early October, late September, uh, bringing back some more of those. We did have some pretty good response. I think we probably would even get more um, response. So between those and our workshops that are run with our partnership with McLean Hospital, uh, this is ways that you as, uh, as parents and families can come together and, and address some of the mental health and anxiety issues that are plaguing our young people right now. Uh, today at about 3 o'clock, the Family Communication Survey went out. This is to gauge how people are accessing information in the district, get uh, feedback on the communication sources that we are using. So if you could please, um, please fill that out. We'll probably send out a reminder. Uh, we'll probably uh, close that off at the end of the month or right at the end of school. Um, another reminder for families that bus registration closes uh, the 30th of June. Uh, after that, we're not taking new registration. So if you need a bus and you want to make sure you have a bus, make sure it's in by the 30th. Otherwise, there are no guarantees. Um, that started a couple weeks ago. Um, so please get that in. If you have problems with the forms or anything on that line, please call, call the transportation. And a quick reminder, the last day of school, again, is the 21st, Wednesday the 21st, it is a half day. Please make note of what time dismissal is. I'm not going to try to list all the different schools at the different levels, uh, but those will be uh, communicated as well. And Monday, June 19th, is the state holiday, Juneteenth, and we will not have school on that day. So we go Friday the 16th, three-day weekend, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. Uh, and then, unfortunately, we need to, I needed to bring back the myth and misunderstandings uh, page. Uh, this past week, um, I got several calls. Um, there are social media um, things going out there about how we are cutting special education. Uh, that is false. I will have people go back to the town meeting slides, slide number 14. 
On slide number 14 are the mandated positions that were in this budget. For special education, we have increased three teaching positions, um, uh, one at the Willett, one at the Oldham, and one at the middle school, and we increased the, one of the adjustment counselors at the Callahan point two. Um, so it's a total of 3.2 additions. Those were on top of what was added throughout this year, um, and three of those are benefited. So again, if you go back to the town meeting slide number 14, uh, you see the, uh, the, the special education piece there and, um, and also um, the English language learner. But um, we, we did not cut any positions in this budget. I'll repeat that again. We did not cut any positions in this budget. If someone is putting that out on Facebook or whatever else, they are sorely misinformed. And I do appreciate the three people that called me for clarification. That doesn't always happen. It just goes around and around and around, and all of a sudden it comes back. But I just wanted to mention that as well. So that's the superintendent report, Madam Chair. Fabulous. Does anyone have any questions for Dave on the superintendent report this evening? Lovely. So we can continue with our agenda. Um, next up on our agenda is budget. Ms. Stewart, would you like yeah. to give the budget subcommittee update? Sure, quick update. Um, in the packet, you have our agenda and link to all of the materials that we reviewed at our last subcommittee meeting, which was on May 24th. Um, just a recap at that time, uh, we looked further into the LMPA principle, but we already covered that at our last meeting on May 31st. Um, we looked a little bit more into some special education requests that I believe are still being worked on and are forthcoming to the full committee over the summer. Um, we spent some time looking again at our priorities and goals document. I went over this in some detail at the previous meeting. As a subcommittee, we are still defining, um, st still seeking and open to feedback from everybody else on the committee. Um, but the balancing committee will be resuming at the end of June, early July. We're still figuring out the dates. Yes, uh, we are still figuring out dates, I think. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's thinking summer, and I think that's a problem. Yeah. So <laughs> well, I think, I think we're definitely going to have to make The last survey that went out was not promising, so yeah. it has to be. Yeah, but we are intending to resume as BBC, so we have a long list of things that as a district we're working on to prepare for that process. Um, at the next meeting for school committee on June 21st, Ms. Sheridan is going to give the Spring Athletic Report. Um, we are also going to be bringing forward the Student Opportunities Act plan in regards to the financial report um, that Ms. Sheridan had to file with the state. Um, we are going to be looking at the middle school staffing for the new building um, more with Dr. Frazek hopefully in August and then into the fall. Um, as we've discussed before, we have contract negotiations with Unit A and Unit B starting in the fall, so starting to do some analysis around there. Um, that is all a quick overview of, of a much longer conversation. <laughs> um, we have scheduled meetings again as a budget subcommittee for June 13th at 1 p.m., July 18th at 10 a.m., and August 8th at 10 a.m. Um, we are only meeting um, twice over the summer as a full subcommittee, um, but we're trying to take a little bit of a different approach as in like working groups. So some of the work Ms. Sheridan and I are working on together, some of the work Dr. Thompson and Dr. Taylor will be working on with the admin team, um, some things Ms. is working on, and then we'll bring it back to the subcommittee because there's a lot of work to do. Um, Ms. Sheridan and I met yesterday to work a little bit more on strategic objective one because as all of you know we're working on the strategic plan for the last year and objective one is investment and resource allocation so she and I were just working on the worksheet and, and getting that done a little bit more before Tuesday's final meeting. Um, if you have any feedback on that that you want us to look at in the strategic objective planning meeting on Tuesday please let us know. When do you need that by? Um, tomorrow, okay. <laughs> so that I can then finish doing what needs to be done for Dr. Thompson and Dr. Taylor. <laughs> um, and then I believe that is it for the budget update at this time, unless there's any questions. We talked about that in the Section 2.1. So, yes, yes. <laughs> All right, so that's the budget um, update. Kate, we have to vote really quick. Do you want to just wait one second? <laughs> <laughs> the next item is a vote, so I just wanted, and since we're done, I figured. Really, I'm sorry, really I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ms. Sheridan. 
We have a budget transfer. Uh, yeah, I thought you were you know, not going to vote. Oh. I know, I was like, I didn't say anything you need to vote, but okay. No, 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 I just, I knew that the, the very next item, yeah. if there were no uh, questions on budget subcommittee, we're going to be. I mean, if you want to vote with in agreement with everything you said, I'll take that. <laughs> Provision agreement, whatever we do. <laughs> I have one budget transfer. Um, vote of affirmation. <laughs> I have a budget transfer approved by the school committee, uh, and Chair Emery has already signed it because it was of an urgent nature, um, given the closing of FY23. Um, it is a Joe kid um, was wanting to purchase a new online security system. Um, the amount of the transfer was fourteen thousand four seventy two, and it was basically basically just moving from the instructional software line to more the infrastructure software line because of the um, it's online security system. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all that I have today. Don't get used to these really short <laughs> <laughs> reports from me. Um, I'll help that. Um, any questions on the budget transfer? No motion to approve. Moved by Teresa, okay. seconded by Kate. Okay, roll call, Joan? Yes. Teresa? Yes. Kate? Yes. David? Yes. I'm yes as well. I pass this five to zero. Kate, you need to go. <laughs> 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 Thank you for staying. Um, okay, so moving on to the next item on the agenda is the middle school building update. Um, Dr. Thompson, do you want to start us off? Or? No. No. <laughs> uh, Teresa will need to because I wasn't at the past two. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we last met on May 22nd as a middle school building committee. Um, the meeting was a lot of approvals, just like paperwork and, and different things and voices um, to move the project along. But a couple of things people should be aware of. Um, with the votes that we took um, at the last meeting, all of the alternates that we have discussed before are proceeding, um, including finishing the concession stand. Um, people should know in town just to be aware of the cost of the concession stand is no. currently at seven um, hundred eight thousand seven hundred and six dollars. I think it is seven oh eight seven oh six. Seven oh eight seven oh six. Yeah. Um, but that is something that we've been talking about all along. It is something the community invested in through fundraising dollars and it is gonna be rebuilt as part of the middle school. It is building. stunning. It is just I say this every time I hear that number because yeah. of the, the fundraising dollars that built the original one. Was and not near that. Oh, uh, not even yeah. close. So some of it's inflation. Some of it is just um, all the different trades that are required to get in that building. Yep. So, um, But the commitment from the Middle School Building Committee is to rebuild it. Um, as the committee knows, before the Middle School Building Committee, um, some of us, Kate and I, were receiving some questions from people in the community around some trees that apparently are slated to be removed by the baseball fields. Um, so that discussion came up at the Middle School Building Committee. Um, Mr. Riccardi had also heard from some people in the community. Um, this seems to be an area that's not directly under the authority of the Middle School Building Committee, kind of overlaps with the authority of Mark Ryan, who is the tree warden. Um, to be entirely candid, I am not quite sure what the next steps are, but I believe Mr. Slater, who's the chair of the MSBC, um, said that an update will be given at the next Middle School Building Committee meeting. But if others in the community are concerned about the tree removal, um, my understanding is that they should contact Mark Ryan, um, but probably would also be helpful to contact Alan Slater um, so that both parties are informed. Um, so we meet again as Middle School Building Committee on Monday, June 12th at 5 p.m. Um, that meeting is actually across the hall here in 219. Um, and then on June 13th, 10 a.m. is the groundbreaking at the Coakley um, that many of us will be at. And then, as Dr. Thompson already mentioned, uh, twice a month meetings with the construction team are starting on Friday, June 16th at 10 a.m. And I think it's important, Dr. Thompson, if we clarify for people that we don't have authority over these meetings. It is the Middle School Building Committee and it is the construction team. So um, places to ask your questions and get feedback on what is actually going on with construction is most suitable for those meetings. Will those meetings, do we know if they're going to be recorded? You know, I asked that question. I didn't get a response, so I do not know. Okay. So then, you know, most community members will not be showing up at that particular time of the day. Yeah. Right. So I, 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 we can find out on Monday. And, I mean, Monday's meeting, the Middle School Building yeah. Committee will definitely be recorded, but I can ask the question again and get back. I know the town definitely has the ability to hit record on any kind of, um, right. you know, yeah. Google, Google Meet and stuff like that, so they could probably, you know, have it. just want to... Yeah, I don't even know if they posted it as a, a hybrid. I think it's just the... 
in person? It's mainly, I mean, the, I mean, back 22 years ago when they were working on, when I was doing my administrative internship and um, they were renovating and adding on to it, it, it basically was a meeting that you would go to to figure out how you were going to do all the construction yeah. bits. And yeah. This first part, because it's mainly large pieces and not connecting and schools aren't really as involved with it, but if that, but but people want to know, you know, yes. what's the truck pattern? Yeah. When's the steel coming in? Right. What's the plan for this? So they those are the kinds of things yeah. where that information will be shared. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just want to, I'm not to suggest this would be a hybrid meeting, oh, as yeah. my probably will not be. Yeah. Um, but I know that you could technically have an owl running and record. Sure. Seat. No, I know. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully, I, hopefully. Yeah, I don't have the answer, but I will. Hopefully, a middle school building committee member, chair, if you're listening. Uh, the community would probably uh, appreciate being able to look back on it and not at a 10 a.m. time. Yeah. Just uh, real quick, Dave, but to the earlier question about um, summer programming, those things overlap in the sense someone's there yeah, representing Yeah, but, but they're still not going to have, they're they not going to have the happening. trucks in during the time when the kids are dropping off and picking up. So that that's sure. already been that's already been already been addressed. That's going to have to be the yeah. case during when school yeah. starts in the fall anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just yeah. making sure that yeah. was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been very thorough, the project mm -hmm. team, in figuring out like blackout times for you know trucks not coming in and supplies not being dropped off. Um, and we did share previously both at a school committee meeting and at the middle school building committee like the plans for the summer. So they are on the middle school building committee website if people want to see exactly which parking lots are being closed and. Yep. Unfortunately, the current concession stand, I believe, is going down June 15th. Like, things mm -hmm. are starting to happen over the next couple of weeks. But there is also the commitment to have the fields in their new version ready to go by August 15th, I believe we said, for the fall sports. Yep. Anything else? Nope, just once we get the agenda and packet for Monday's meeting, I'll send it out as always. And then if there's any questions that you want David or Dave and I to bring to the meeting on Monday, let us know. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving to the next item. Um, so we have long-term agenda review on here. Um, we also have it listed on the long-term agenda for next week, mm -hmm. or for our next meeting. Um, we have... I'm going to suggest that if nobody has anything to talk about for June 21st meeting or that we can discuss that now and then we postpone the 23-24 discussion until next meeting if that is okay with everybody here unless there are specific questions really burning people's minds they need to discuss right now about long-term agenda. Just one quick question. The rest of it's 23-24 and can wait but um, I have asked a couple of times about an executive session solely focused on safety and the CAP, um, and just wondering if that's something. We can yeah. Discuss. So there's there's a couple things that people are working on this summer. Okay. On that, so I think September would probably be okay. a good time to go through that again. Okay. So then, yeah. Amory, as you're continuing to work on the 23, 24, yeah. if you could just put yeah. that. Yeah. And if and if everybody didn't know, uh, see it, um, Jamie did make. Um, a folder for 2324 and added a long-term agenda with our meeting dates in there. Okay. Um, I plan to go in there and I don't think she actually like moved over any of like the parking lot stuff or started to populate it for, um, except maybe for the, uh, I asked that because we had July, August kind of tacked on to the 22, 23 and I asked her to move those over. So I think those should start to be populated. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously it is available to everybody to view. So feel free to please to go in there and um, start making suggestions, um, but that I will um, begin to move over the half twos um, mm -hmm. into that into that list um, and start the parking lot so that we can start moving things in, and that is the discussion. Obviously, I would like to have that done before mm -hmm. Friday packet due for the next meeting. Okay. So that is the plan. Thank you. Um, as we look at this really quickly, um, did we get a confirmation on? Old him, old him playground, the old him playground. No, no it's still working. No. Yeah, okay. still working think, on it. Yeah. Do we think it'll be ready for the twenty first or no? Good question. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> we let would like it to be. Let us know when you know. Yep. Yes. What about the Cleveland sensor, sensory area? Because were they planning to start taking things down over the summer? Because if they were, they do have to come back to us. I will have to check on that. I think that yeah, we 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 did discuss that um, and okay. in, in moving it to the twenty first and with the. Um, 
plan to check in with both of those schools okay. to see if they're ready to come to us with something because obviously if they're going to do work and we did actually discuss that if they're going to do work over the summer that we should yeah. have that approved beforehand okay. but definitely it's listed right now on the long-term agenda for under the 21st and then right. but just to be clear for my own clarification so we've approved their fundraising efforts and process they what uh, basically they come back and say here's the money but then it goes to Riccardi and and um, Ms. Sheridan in terms of getting that money to the appropriate contracting folks like we don't there's nothing in terms of the plans on our lap it's more about making sure that Mr. Riccardi well, we still approve the plan. So if they're going to begin start to begin removing items, we do still need to. We have to, we have to accept the money before they can spend it. Exactly. So if if if, if they're going to spend it on removal, that's so yes. I mean yes. We use is essentially. I thought we already. So we already accepted. We voted to approve their the efforts, their fundraising. Efforts. Correct. But the according so to once the, the money exists, then yes. we say okay, great. Yeah, we're so, and that's the policy we've been working out, right? Um, and how, how that's the why case, I'm asking the exactly, question. and how yeah. KCD would work. And it, I mean, it makes I think we've kind of been coming to that it makes the most sense that if you're going to have a massive project before you start fundraising, you should probably come and talk to us and get pre-approval. I mean, our policy says that you will we will accept the donation, but you certainly wouldn't want to come to us and say, "Here's a donation for a playground that we're going to say absolutely not because right. we're going to have to maintain this monstrosity." <coughs> Right. Um, once you donate it um, so yeah so we did approve in theory right the the playground that they were planning on or the sensory yeah. area right um, but now we would actually need to accept do so the donation is that before work sort of that check-in point yeah and does it make sense that then they will have conferred with facilities so that when we they're they're not just passing it on to us with the a bunch of you know non recommendations or whatever like for right. us right how does a that actually work once yeah. we get the money in hand um, because I think we need to try and eliminate as many middle steps as possible you know like they should if we've approved the effort then they should figure out the rest of the legwork and say okay here's here's what it yeah, is I and then we have more I, information yeah, to work with I think I, I think probably be handing people a checklist with or something similar yeah would be okay. the best That's, way to, to go forward so yeah no we're still we're still yeah, it's working on the yeah. exact process. I think this has been every time we come up with something, it's like, no way, that's not going to work, you know. And or we, you know, we, we try to go through the process, and it's like, well, that was just that was too many steps, or some, or you know, you know, we're taking the feedback from the PTOs that, well, that's just too much, and that's or that's confusing, you know, or can you just give me like the steps? Well, and I think <laughs> we're, we need input from principals too, which yeah, you know, everybody's super busy right now. But and I think there's a mishmash too, that. right? Like we can kind of check off the low hanging fruit, like a massive, you know, capital project is very different from like accepting, you know, a donation for a smaller item. Okay. Um, well, I think even these two projects are different because with Mr. Olson's, I think it's just the swing, right? The handicap swing. And he told us when we approved the fundraising that he was already in coordination with Mr. Riccardi and he knew it was coming up this summer and it was pretty much changing the swing structure and yeah. down mulch. Where the Cleveland project is a multi-phase project, I believe, as Hutchins said, over two years. So the first step is whatever money they donate it going into being able to take down the current structure that's in front of the school. So that's what I'm anticipating would come back to us for approval. But then when they get to their next step of raising money next year and start to build, they would have to come back again. To, to donate it because at this point we know what their fundraising right but strategy we have, but we have to accept the money accepting them exactly before, before the structure is built it or do exactly with it. yep and okay. to be clear the money is expended by so it comes to you as a donation right and they tell you my if they you're accepting the idea that they want to fundraise for a playground, wouldn't Paul Riccardi and the school be designing the playground? It's just they're donating the money for the playground. Is that what you're yeah. asking me? Well, that was part of what we had said about the sensory area. So right. when they came in January, I think it was, Mr. Olson was in a, a different starting point than Ms. Hutchins. 
Yeah. Okay. So I am thinking You're talking about the big one, right? So at the Cleveland, there's a small playground right now in the front mm -hmm. near where you drop your kids off, and it's not really utilized, so they're taking it down and they're turning that area into some type of sensory activity. We haven't been told what they were trying to do. I hope they're working with Mr. Riccardi, but I do think these two projects probably gonna be a little live and learn here, right, and help us yeah. figure it out because they are very different in where they started and where they're going. Yeah. That's kind of where I was going with it. Okay. Like we're kind of writing the rules as we the money should come in as a donation and then that's where the pto i, I think that's where it ends with the pto once they yeah. donate the money then there should it have already been a school's yeah. responsibility so too. i can tell you that they're going to be concerned or because of the way things have always been done that they then um that it's not going to be used we just need to assure and reiterate that it will be only can only be used for the intended project which we voted for and approved oh yeah oh so it's, yeah, it's you, a restricted yes. donation exactly it's yes. restricted the law doesn't donation. allow you to use it it's not well. like you're going to take the money and run it is only intended for the purpose of for which they raised it mm -hmm. and so you would then issue that payment to whatever contracted employee uh, uh, sorry contractor was established through the facilities department so if they right. have can provide that information if it will expedite that process, right? Right, but yeah. any any donation that has a restricting restriction, it, right. even if it's not the PTO, can only be used for that restriction. Right, so it comes off of their books it, once it's a donation to the district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah. okay. And we can, uh, we can totally talk about that more offline. Like yeah, more yeah, we'll, we'll have that's to. That's not and, something and that's, we like, as a sub The checklist policy. template also is on my yeah. list as well, too. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else on long-term agenda? No. Okay. Um, moving on to the next item, policy. So um, policy subcommittee update. Kate will give that. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, just let me pull my notes up. So we met uh, very briefly on the first and um, decided to adjourn and meet on the sixth when we had all the information we needed for the handbook that we reviewed for today. Um, and um, we talked about that and the questions that had come up. So that's resolved. Um, there was a question about the memori our memorial policy and based on what MASC had responded with, that it really varies district by district, um, and, and depending upon sort of district culture and different variables um, as to what language, but I would recommend, and I said this to the committee, that we just leave our language as is with, with possibly, and this was based on the feedback I got after the meeting, but with possibly adding something about um, a waiting period it could be worth the discussion. Um, um, because we, you just, you don't want to, um, you, the trick is always have, making sure people understand the policy and know the policy before they start a project, right? Um, so that's kind of where that stood. Um, Dr. Taylor is steady working on the MASC updates, comparison what was changed, taking out what, ha, you know, what's no longer recommended, um, comparing it to what we had already, you guys had already done in the last um, very recent past um, and just to back to what we were just talking about a little bit dr. Thompson is still getting input from the principals for this template I had offered a template of what we uh, sort of a guide rails this document that will serve as guide rails for the PTOs but also maybe a checklist but um, is meant to be a sheet a form that they can fill out at the beginning of the year to talk about what their intentions and plans are for the year that could be submitted through the principal. That's why we need them to be, everybody to be on the same page. Um, and then that's, so So we're just waiting on that to be done. But I noticed um, for the long-term agenda, it said KCD vote. And I'm wondering if that's the, the sort of circling back of that template that we wanna vote on that. Um, and. Dr. Thompson, you had said like July for this template, but I'm wondering, do you, is it feasible to have something more solid and ready to go by June 21st, our next meeting? Or should we just push that off the, yeah, to I July? Think, I, I think July is a little more 
to, I mean, we can look at it. Okay. I have, there's there's a pile of things that have piled up. Sharice has been sick this entire week. Yeah, so I know. That's She's I did see that as well, and I was like, yeah. hmm. So <laughs> I, I just need, I, yeah. I, I just want to look back to the PTOs with something, yeah. especially okay. since they're going to be turning over soon. Um, I'll just give them, a, I'll, I'll send an email to you to see if it makes sense, but just okay. to let them know where things are at, um, reflect some of the conversation yeah. we just had. Right. Um, and even if we come up with something, we'd like to review it with the principal, but that's, it's crazy time. Yeah, and it might actually be a good thing to have that ready for the turnover. Like, it might, but uh, but I, I agree with you, like, letting them know what, where we are in the process right. to, to inform the people, you know, people who will be taking over is a, yeah. a good idea. But I think, like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I, we're doing I, it. I, absolutely. I think the, yeah, I think that, that's the issue. I can just email the list I currently have. Um, Sorry, just to clarify, Dave, we we certainly need input from the principals before mm -hmm. we give a template to the BTOs. You just said, re them or just were you saying they may or may not review it? Or no, no. Well, I don't think between now and the end of school is a time to ask. The okay. Principals. Yeah. Right. And Sharice so. actually just commented that unfortunately she would not be ready. By Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> just 21st. check it so we can move that off of that right. for next week. Do you next have time. Do you have samples of that from other districts already? No, no I just kind of put together a really, um, I think I copied you on it, but if not, I'll send it to you. It's just to, to get started the idea of um, a template of what people are forecasting for the year and doing how the, the check-in process will go through the principal to us for mm -hmm. approval and then like as we're talking about what those check-in points again are. Because I can try to see from a couple of business managers. That'd be great, yeah. If there's any mm -hmm. that they've already done, and then yep. you okay. don't have yeah, to recreate the wheel. That would be if you can get something like that, helpful. and give it to Sharice and I, that'd be okay. great. Oh yeah, and I'd love to see it too, just, and then um, just for my edification, since I'm looking at it, but yeah, we definitely, ha I think that your, your, all the contact information, you know, yours is on there and all of that stuff, so. Okay. Um, that horse is dead. Sorry. If I could just briefly, oh, yeah. um, you may want to bring this up at strategic planning on Tuesday because the objective that was tied into KCD was taken off the strategic plan because in that last meeting we had, people were under the assumption it was completely done. I don't know if the principals realize this is this, this additional step. And I'm not saying it has to go back on the strategic plan, but it may be helpful just to say to the room of everybody on Tuesday, we are going to need your feedback right. on this piece. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be resolved really soon. I don't think it needs to go back on the strategic plan. Yeah, we've got we've got our, our administrative meeting next next Wednesday. Okay. So, and, the heads and, up. and a wrap up on the twenty second. So. Yeah, I mean, I. Yeah. If they have something to respond to, that's probably helpful yeah. too. Okay. And, and just something the sub the policy committee should be aware of it. The uh, elementary handbook should be done th li this week. Uh, and I've asked the elementary principals to give us a couple dates and times when they could meet with us to talk about the handbook. So that will be at some point next week. Okay. Um, we can get that quickie posted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we can use the date for our next meeting for sure. Um, sorry. Tio. So we talked a little bit about our priorities document. And that w was shared with Joan and Teresa for aligning our goals. Um, and that seems to be, that's an in-process discussion, I feel like. Um, and so as the goals discussion comes up, I think we can nail that down. We, we talked a lot about engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know when it makes sense to have a, a whole, or, uh, uh, excuse me, a full committee discussion about that, and maybe it makes more sense when we're talking about goals in general. But we we did sort of brainstorm around some low hanging fruit and ways that we could potentially use social media and Parent Square um, to educate around policy that don't involve. I think I'm going to sneeze. Bless you. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. Bless excuse me that don't involve putting a big load, uh, an extra workload on both um, 
school committee members by creating a whole other subcommittee that we ne don't necessarily have the bandwidth for mm -hmm. um, or the admin. So looking at ways to um, extend engagement, it's already been improved a bunch this year, um, but there are potentially some other small things that we could do. Um, we talked about the um, student, um, the student uh, advisory council, and a lot of what came up sort of at the end is kind of where we landed. We need to look at. It looks like next year is pretty well set, mm -hmm. but we looked at um, potentially for the year after creating a an additional council council position to create more student opportunity, but also to resolve the issue around it having an advisor or not having an advisor because we are struggling to find an advisor and I think where we landed on that um, is that we need to re-engage with you um, around that so um, just to see in the council of and the students just to well sure yeah, you, an yeah. ongoing conversation but it feels like next year it's kind of underway so yes. I'm not sure how I we're going to yeah next yeah, year we need to have a during plan, plan yeah. by March if we're gonna if there's any sort of adjustments yeah. to but it, it did make sense when we were talking about it to, you know, maybe add an additional position because it, even the vice presidents, you know, don't necessarily have the bandwidth with all the other things that they have to do in that position. And then it would also increase the number of students that could be involved in student council. Just give a little more. Because uh, one of the things that came up was, like, the, the kids who, who um, apply to do student government day mm -hmm. aren't any of the student council members. They're the ones who want to, who come, who apply to be the superintendent and the school committee members. Like so, there's definitely some interest right. in this in the um, student body. You know, outside of the people who want to be right. president of the class mm -hmm. well, and to be involved with the school committee. Like, I mean, if someone wanted to do more than one role, they could, but it could be another opportunity to get some units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, just, so it was I mean, just an option. It was yeah, something that, that we talked about right. early too in when we meantime, first started yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, and in the meantime, I think the so the the question standing question is about the advisor, and so we need to understand for next year how it's how it's going to work because I think the stipend conversation is not going to happen in time for next year, correct? No, it's or happening tonight in executive session. Well, no, no, it is. It's on the agenda, and so is material. So we can't talk about it here, but we will be. But, but there's some things to be okay. It's an executive session topic. I didn't think it would be resolved quite the timeline wouldn't match up, but. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. I just can't say what I want to say until we get to executive session. <laughs> um, so, TBD. TBD. Uh, we talked a little bit about creating how policy updates are disseminated since we, we are getting on a regular cycle of biannual policy check-ins um, that when things um, happen on our end or at the state level, um, how is that disseminated to the to admin, and we talked a little bit about, in addition to your meetings where you give announcements that there might be sort of cheat sheets available um, so that folks are aware in, in amongst their busy, busy, busy um, lives what policies um, are relevant and they should focus on. Um, uh, I don't think there's really much else of note. Um, talked about engagement about we should be emphasizing accomplishments. It's a balancing game of having efficient business meetings and um, using these meetings as you know to be an engagement opportunity um, to let people know how great uh, the great things going on in the district. So that will continue to be something that we have to balance and um, can do. All right, that's it for me, you guys. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, we we are waiting to see when our next date will be based on the handbooks and because we had to get off the phone very quickly today so or yesterday mm -hmm. any questions no thank you Kate just you mentioned the goal um, work that Joan and I are going to do so just so everyone knows Joan and I are meeting as the goal subcommittee on Friday morning at 10 a.m. Um, so I have access to your document but if there was anything else that you wanted us to have for policy um, or David if there's anything that you were thinking or Anne-Marie in addition to all the budget stuff we already talked about just get it to Joan and I over the next you know 36 hours you said um, Friday at Friday 10. at 10 yeah and then I don't I don't know if we'll be ready to like vote on something on June 21st I think it might just be the first discussion with what we put that together makes sense. Yeah. and then probably vote over the okay. summer finish over the summer yeah that makes sense <laughs> you do know my summer school committee to-do list is 
very long already. But, but yes. Well, well, we wouldn't want you to get bored <laughs> on the beach. Don't let her fool you. We'll be wrestling to the death at Perks at 10 a.m. on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be ready. <laughs> we can't go to Perks. It's an open meeting. We're meeting remotely. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll be wrestling to the death remotely. <laughs> well, I have a client at 11.30, so you can wrestle me from 10 to 11.30. Then i got to go do my real job. <laughs> All right. I think we're set for policy. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, next agenda item, legislative advocacy. Yeah, so quick update. So Jody Smith and I met with Representative Rogers on June 1st. Um, and as everybody knows, we've sent him two letters so far. So we just went through those two letters. One was on all the funding pieces. One was on the Thrive Act. Um, overall, I think it was a very productive, positive meeting. Uh, Representative Rogers had a lot of very positive things to say about our teachers, about our district, about the work that we all are collectively doing. Um, I think he was supportive of everything that we asked him to advocate for. Um, he had mentioned that the House, Senate, and Governor's budget are all on the same page with a Chapter 70% increase, and Norwood can expect an increase of 28.8% for FY24 in Chapter 70. Um, he also said that everybody, House, Senate, and Governor, um, remains fully committed to full funding of the Student Opportunity Act, and that the remainder of the seven years of the SOA will be rolled out appropriately. Um, so that is good news. Uh, we did spend some time talking about Chapter 70 and the Student Opportunities Act and the legislative intent of Chapter 70. Um, so Representative Rogers shared that his understanding of the law is that the legislative intent is that all of Chapter 70 goes to schools. Um, he referenced Section 3 of the Annual Appropriation Act. Um, he said that it was a legislative intent to separate out Chapter 70 from the UGGA. The UGGA is the Unrestricted General Government Aid, and that is why it's not all lumped into one, that there's the school funding and then the other funding. Um, he also shared with us that although some districts and towns have agreements about a certain percentage of Chapter 70 going to the municipality, um, that there's no legislative requirement to do that. Um, we talked about, again, our funding letters. We had asked him to support the House Docket 1419, uh, which concerns the Special Education Reserve Funds. Um, this has now become a bill, so House Bill uh, 2075, um, that Representative Rogers is a co-sponsor of. Um, so what that bill um, is asking for, which is what we asked him to advocate for, um, is that instead of only 2% of your net school spending being allowed in a Special Education Reserve Fund, that it be increased to 5%. So again, this won't cost anybody more money, but it'll just allow us to manage money in a more thoughtful and, and long-term way. Um, he invited Ms. Smith and I to come testify. Um, so he's gonna let us know when that date is. We will certainly let others know and possibly go and testify on that bill. Um, we asked him to support House Docket 3170. Um, this was in regards to Special Education Circuit Breaker. Um, he said he did recently speak with the Senate chair. Um, he's going to continue conversations, letting us know if an opportunity to testify comes up about that. Um, but again, what this one was focused on is lowering the threshold from 4% of per pupil cost down to 3%. That way, circuit breaker money kicks in sooner. Um, he said that this is something that he's been supportive of. He's always been supportive of circuit breaker. Um, he was also supportive of advocating that Circuit Breaker can increase to 90% reimbursement instead of 75. Um, he will continue to advocate. Um, there's no bill right now, but he will talk and continue to advocate around that school districts should be able to fully retain Medicaid revenues and reimbursement. Um, we had a really good conversation around the change in demographics in Norwood. Um, Jody and I shared a little bit more about like our high needs populations, what we're experiencing in the school districts. Some of the issues that Lisa brought up around the scatter shelter and increasing homeless students, we shared with him so he would be aware of what is going on in Norwood. Uh, Ms. Smith asked about the fair share amendment, um, and Representative Rogers stated that the money is not in yet. Um, he didn't tell us when it would be. <laughs> he, he just said not yet. Um, but he did say that um, we can expect that once the money is in, it'll be a 50-50 split between transportation and education. Um, he does anticipate that the transportation will all go towards the MBTA, which can't say I fault that use of money. Um, <laughs> Maybe I would actually take it. <laughs> um, but that he is not yet, he does not yet know where the, um, exactly which aspect of education it will fund, but 50% of the fair share amendment will come towards education in some capacity. 
Um, he mentioned that in the House budget, the McKinney Vento was fully funded, so hopefully as the budget continues to be worked on, um, that remains. Uh, we discussed the challenges of transportation and with the Fannie Vans, that way he can advocate for us there. Um, then we start to talk a little bit about the Addressing Barriers to Care Mental Health Act and 37H and 3 fourths. Um, now we as a school committee and union have not written a letter on this yet, so Jody and I made it very clear that at this point in the meeting, I was speaking as me, she was speaking as her. We were not speaking on behalf of all of you. Um, but we did have a candid discussion again of some of the challenges that we are seeing in the district. And I told Representative Rogers that essentially 37H and 3 fourths has become an unfunded mandate. And I asked him what he was going to do about that. <laughs> um, so he did mention um, that there is currently some money in the state reserve that came from ARPA um, that has to be spent or it will be returned to the federal government. So he is going to talk to Senator Rush. He's going to get back to Ms. Smith and I. Um, but he is going to help get us some money for our schools that can be solely focused on getting in the mental health support and the behavioral support that we now need as mandated by law. So we will report back to you on that. Um, he also was talking about the inflation cap of Chapter 70. Um, there's a House bill. I think I wrote this number down wrong, so I'm going to have to get back to you because I couldn't find it when I went online. But there is a bill on inflation cap of Chapter 70. Um, apparently in 2007, 2009, there was some formula that didn't account for inflation, and he's still trying to get retrospect funding from 07, 09. Um, but then also moving forward, um, it would get rid of the inflation cap. So again, another way that Chapter 70 more accurately um, accounts for what's going on in the world. Um, we discussed our letter on the Thrive Act. At this point, I handed it over to Ms. Smith, who did a phenomenal job explaining all the challenges with MCAS and why we wrote the letter on the Thrive Act. Um, Representative Rogers said he has previously tried to get the graduation requirement of MCAS to go away. So he will continue that advocacy and those discussions. Um, and then lastly, um, he had mentioned the MSBA funding. So as I think we talked about before, the state did pass additional money going towards new building projects, um, but he is still trying to get more money for our building project. Um, so projects who are in the process of being built and have been hit by inflation. Yeah, there's, I just wanted to, I actually wrote myself just a note for that because yeah. I, I have a friend who's on a school committee in a different district in the North Shore. Yeah. And I think there's some conflicting information because he was, he was arguing with me saying, no, there's money for existing it's projects. It's only for new ones. No, he kept saying existing projects. No, we're in our third year. And, we're, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and I was like, mm. no, it's new. No, it's existing. And mm. so. I wonder if there's just conflicting information out there. I mean, I, I can ask, I can look, but what I've read was that it's for new projects. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought yeah, too. I thought it was that. Yeah. But uh, maybe worth one more. Yeah, I can. I can definitely find Is out. Is this the funding you thought was going to come through because of the inflation? And it was what I was advocating for. Yeah. yeah. And then the state did act, but only for new projects, not for current. So currently, in the House budget, they are trying to get 300 million for projects in process. In the Senate budget. It has been reduced to 100 million, but now they go to conference committee, so they have to argue it out and advocate, and then he'll get back to us. Um, he did ask and suggest that um, we meet again. That can be any of us in the school committee and the union um, at the end of June. So he has some time to work on this, get back to us. Um, then he also wants to pull Senator uh, Rush into our meeting as well. So that is our update. Teresa, the offer funding yeah. that he was talking about yeah. is that. The town's offer funding? Mm -hmm. It was no, at the state, state level. It's state. in the reserve fund at the state level. They haven't yet allocated it. So he was going to try to get some of it for us. Because uh, didn't the offer funding go to the town previously? Yes, but he, he would try to earmark to get it some for the, the schools. schools. Okay. Yeah. Right. The school's got us or the town's got ARPA. Yes. Right. Yep. Hopefully, Ms. Smith, you agree with my recap. Joe, do you agree with my recap? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> she nodded up. <laughs> right. uh, any questions for Teresa? Um, I just want to thank you both for meeting um, with uh, Representative Rogers and representing us and trying to get some more money for the district because we sorely need it. Maybe you could advocate next time for any sort of guidance on rules and laws that disproportionately affect the more diverse and larger school districts when 
the agency that is tasked with overseeing that had no idea and still has no idea how to enforce those rules. So. Listen, in case you forgot, I spent my whole time as chair hounding Desi. So if you <laughs> want me to write letters or call people, give me your list. <laughs> I'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> She has no fear. <laughs> I don't. I will talk to anybody and tell them why they need to revisit their decisions. <laughs> Maybe if they talk to educational professionals, we wouldn't be in the place that we're in with 37 age and three quarters. But I'm sorry. Nope, that totally. Was my one <laughs> Go ahead. David digress. Um, okay. All right. So moving on um, to our next items uh, under new business, um, we have uh, we need to vote on a tech board representative. Yep. Um, so we need to do that yearly uh, for the past two, three years. Uh, I have done it. It could be the superintendent or, or the school committee member. Uh, the meetings tend to be Friday mornings, 9 o'clock, 9, 9 o'clock, 8.30, something like that. Uh, they have been virtual the last year. I don't know if that will change. There is a new executive director coming on. Before that, they were at Dr. Tech Parks. in Walpole. Um, so... I am willing to do it again unless there is a member who wants to do it. Does any member have a burning desire to be on tech? I think you're in your fourth year. It's been a while since I was a school committee member. Okay. I think the 9 a.m. Friday is what just we all go. Ugh. I, have a I, I can't do that. I know. I have I have a standing meeting at work at that right. time. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's about it's about 60% supers and 30% school committees. Oh, that's good. I'll make a motion to approve that Dr. Thompson should continue as our tech board representative in Norwood. Second. Second by David. Okay, roll call. Joan? Yes. Teresa? Yes. Kate? Yes. David? Yes. I'm the yes as well. Five to zero. Welcome back, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was a short trip. <laughs> there, right there, back. All right, so next on the uh, agenda is, uh, well, I thought it was me. It says you. Well, but you can please yeah. take it away. So it's, um, yeah, so Union 50, which is our paraprofessionals union, uh, would like to offer a scholarship starting this next year for the 2023 school year uh, for two academic scholarships of $1,000 per student. So the school committee needs to accept uh, the scholarship, and then I think they have a donation towards it as well, towards the bottom of it. Yeah, I was wondering why, I was like, I know we had talked about this, and I'm like, it's in two places. Are we doing this, is that correct? So we're asking to, and so in this case, we're asking to approve giving out the scholarship, right. and then the next will be to approve the actual donation, donation correct? Yes. Okay. Yep. Move to approve the two scholarships. Second. Second. Okay, go ahead. Oh, Kate. Seconded by Kate. Um, so roll call, Joan? Yes. Teresa? Yes. Kate? Yes. David? Yes. I'm a yes as well, so five to zero. All right, so the next thing is that Unit 50 has a donation of 200000 <laughs> wow. That's what Michael was looking for. <laughs> to one thousand, ter uh, yeah, t Teresa's going to kill me. Uh, to one thousand uh, scholarships for a grand total of two thousand dollars. That was any questions? Motion to approve or accept. Moved by Teresa. Second. I was like, fight over it, guys. Second. <laughs> David, roll call. Joan. Yes. Yeah. Teresa. Yes. Kate. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, yes. I couldn't get Kate out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. David. Yes. <laughs> and I'm a yes as well, so that passes five to zero. And thank you very much, Union Fifty. That is a wonderful um, token. Uh, not token. Like I died. You know. Donation. Yeah. Gift. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. Scholarship. All of the above. <laughs> my my English just failed me right there. Okay. Um, so that brings us to school committee agenda. Um, I will start on the screen. Joan, do you have anything tonight? I have no agenda this evening other than congratulations to the seniors. Thank you. Teresa? Yeah, also congratulations to the class of 2023. Um, and then just very briefly, um, I like the appearance portion of our meetings. <laughs> um, it, it, I know it takes a while, um, but it, it gives us a chance to really acknowledge and appreciate um, you know, all that is good. And it is just, if people really take the time to listen to what people are telling us and their parents, it's our budget in action, it's our policy in action, it's our support in action. Um, and hearing directly from our students, as I said earlier, so very important. Um, and I love hearing from Mr. Longley and Mr. Kerr, and um, it's important to hear from Lisa and Lori and to just continue to celebrate and also figure out ways to support our student body. 
Kate, do you have anything this evening? No, I'm all set. Thanks. David? Um, just to reiterate uh, what the, my fellow board members have said, I wanted to congratulate the uh, students as well as the uh, families of the class of 2023. I had the opportunity just to sit in and then to Dr. Galligan and his staff. Um, record breaking in terms of the efficiency uh, of that ceremony. So uh, a shout out to them and I hope that they enjoy that and celebrate it. All of those things. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is uh, obviously about our um, public comment. You know, as we go through and we construct this new building, um, uh, you know, part of the policy of the school committee is engagement. And, um, you know, obviously as it was spoken about, um, you know, with the name to see all of those people here expressing their views, um, you know, and sharing information with us. I think that is sort of the, not that is sort of the goal, that is the goal um, of that policy. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean the name is going to change, but it's to solicit feedback. And, and I think it's really just the opening of a conversation as we go on um, the next couple months too. So to those that reached out, we appreciate that. To those that uh, showed up and um, spoke, uh, you were eloquent and we appreciate your uh, feedback and your engagement with us and we look forward to continue engaging with you as we go through uh, the rest of this process Thank you um, You kind of started it. I just wanted to say I actually you know it, it would be surprising for some people to hear but I wanted to thank the um, people who came out for public comment today um, it can be Defeating as a school committee member to see things that are on uh, social media day in and day out um, especially as we've said a gazillion times, you know, it's a, it's a volunteer, volunteer. It's an elected position. We know it's elected, um, but it's unpaid. Let's go with that. Um, it is a lot of hours. It's a lot of work. Um, and so it can get really frustrating. Um, but we understand that that's, you know, what happens when things are out in the public um, without all of the details. And I will leave that at that. But I wanted to thank the people who came and spoke at public forum because to actually come and speak to the elected officials who are who are making decisions that you may be unhappy about, that's the civic process at work. Um, and that is what this public forum is supposed to be for. I will remind everybody in the public that we're the only elected body left that has a public forum. Um, we're not required to have it you know, at all, but we feel like it, it, we have felt it's important to leave um, as part of our agenda. Um, and that, that, yeah, there are no other elected boards left um, in the town that have that opportunity to mm -hmm. come and just have your three minutes to speak face to face to the people um, who are doing things that maybe you do like and maybe you don't. Um, I do, I think the, the members who came today, they were very respectful, um, concise, followed the protocol, followed the policy, and I really do really appreciate that. And it just makes me actually feel good um, as a school committee member that, you know, there are, we can have civil discourse um, appropriately. Um, so that is it. Um, and congrats to the class of 2023, because everybody else said that, and I gotta make sure that I, <laughs> that I say that as well. Um, congratulations for uh, getting through and for getting through graduation without getting rained on. Yeah, it was like <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so. With that, um, we have come to the end of our public meeting. We do unfortunately need to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of contract negotiation discussions. Um, we will only reconvene for the purpose of adjournment. I do need a motion to go into executive Move session. Moved executive by David, second. seconded by Teresa. Roll call, Joan. Yes. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's a no. Still on, the <laughs> Still on the trigger finger at the end. <laughs> Teresa. Yes. Kate. Yes. David. Yes. I am a yes as well. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and we will see you back in this room on June 21st at 7 p.m. Um, for our last school year meeting, last meeting of F of 20 FY 23.